Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you here and open the summer school on high performance and disruptive computing and remote sensing. And I would like to thank everybody involved here, especially Gabriele Cavallaro for organizing this. And we are extremely pleased to have this event here at the University of Iceland and also online. My name is Jonas Lebenditsson. I'm Rector and President of the University of Iceland. And I will give you a few opening remarks. And they are threefold and I have 15 minutes or maybe 13 right now. So I will just tell you what I'm going to tell you. First, I'm going to talk about the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, GRSS. I used to be president of that society for a while and editor-in-chief of the transactions. And it has a very, very important place in my soul, I could say. And then I will talk about the University of Iceland and then a little bit about the topic, but you will obviously learn a lot more about the topic here, but where University of Iceland is placed in this topic. So uh, if we talk about IEEE, uh, IEEE is the largest academic and professional society in the world with approximately 430,000 members in 160 countries. And uh, the reason why, why I'm talking about the IEEE here is that I really recommend the IEEE. And especially the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, uh, which is one of the 39 societies of the IEEE. Um, that is the one that is, uh, we can say, the basis for this uh, summer school here. Uh, the geoscience and remote sensing. It's a society that is operating all over the world. It was founded in 1969 and uh, its scope, scope is on, we can say, remote sensing and everything related with, with that. And uh, it now has about 5,000 members in 94 countries and it also has local chapters. We have these members all over the world but we have local activities, 69 chapters, 22 student chapters and 11 ambassadors. So this is a very active society. And while I was president 10 years ago, we had just over 3000 members. So we can say it is growing quite a bit. So uh, if we look at the Remote Sensing Society, what does it offer? It has publications, conferences, professional activities, education, and then technical activities. And we can say what we have here uh, touches on education, technical activities, and professional activities in a way. And it has technical committees. And I can tell you when I was at the first meetings of the technical committees of the uh, Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, and that was in 1994. Then there were only three technical committees but now we have much more. And uh, this summer school is uh, built or uh, is with the ESI, the Earth Science Informatics uh, Technical Committee. And it's very important what these technical committees are doing. These are sort of emerging uh, items that are being looked at. But the GRSS also has technical publications. And I would like to highlight, what am I doing here? The uh, technical publications, that is, uh, we have uh, three uh, major publications that have been published for quite some time. The Transactions, which is the flagship journal, and uh, uh, we could say has been very, very important for a long time. And then we have the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Letters, and then we have JSTARS, which is more we can application oriented, selected topics in applied earth observations and remote sensing. These are all excellent journals. And then the most recent one, one is uh, the magazine. And that has actually now the highest impact factor of all these journals. But these are very important. So uh, just to sum up, 
I strongly recommend if you have not already joined the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society to join it because it is really, really something that uh, will benefit you professionally. Just a brief note about the University of Iceland. Here we are at the University of Iceland. Just some facts and figures about the university. We have now about 15,700 students. The university is now celebrating 110 years of operations. And it is by far the largest university in Iceland, but it's a broad university with five schools, but it is also very well connected internationally. We have about 1300 teaching and research staff and um, we can say overall our staff members are around uh, 2000. We have many sessional um, uh, staff members, also sessional te uh, teachers. And uh, we have been ranked uh, highly by many, many publications in the world that do university rankings. And I would like to point out specifically our ranking in the Shanghai subject rankings. Uh, we are now currently ranked 45 in the electrical and electronic engineering. And in remote sensing, we are at number seven. And we have been ever since the start in the top 10 of these rankings from 2017. So remote sensing is probably our strongest topic. And uh, we have had some excellent graduates and excellent professors here. And we have collaborations with all, over 400 universities in the world. And uh, here we see a list of our main collaborators. But in terms of remote sensing, I would like to note specifically uh, a few universities that we collaborate very much with and research center the ULIC Supercomputer Center in Germany. I will mention that. Gabriele is with that. The University of Extremadura in Spain with Professor Antonio Plaza. We have collaborated for many years with him. University of Trento, Italy, uh, Professor Lorenzo Bruzzone, Grenoble Alps University in France with Professor Justin Chanuso, Hunan University in China with Professor Xu uh, Tao Li, University of Genoa in Italy, Professor Sebastiano Serpico and uh, Gabriele Moser and Purdue University in, U in the US with Professor Melba Crawford. But we have many, many more. I just want to say these are the ones that we most strongly collaborate with. We have a science park here on the campus. It's being developed. And you will see um, uh, here just the next building is Groska, the new innovation and business growth center and that uh, one is something I hope you can visit. There we, for example, have our computer science uh, in, in this building. This is probably the newest building on campus. So we are very much focusing on innovation. So uh, if we look at remote sensing and HPC, uh, which is the topic here, uh, high performance computing and supercomputing is extremely important and it's a growing field in importance. And uh, if we look at artificial intelligence, big data, artificial intelligence through machine and deep learning, we have artificial in intelligence as a wide area of techniques and tools that enable computers to mimic human behavior and robotics. And then we can say we have machine learning, learning from data without explicitly being programmed with common programming language, and then deep learning systems with the ability to learn underlying features and data using large neural networks. And what we are seeing, we have a lot of data currently. We would like to extract information from those data and we need complicated approaches. And uh, the model performance is significant with the big data. And if we only have small data sets, we can say the approaches are not that important. But when we have uh, big data and we, have, we need complicated approaches, we need to use supercomputing and we need high performance computing in order to maintain, we can say, we maintain uh, the processing speed and obtain the accuracy. 
Um, at the University of Iceland, and also in a broader scale at the University uh, or in Iceland, uh, we have an Icelandic HPC community being developed. And uh, we have uh, some of the actors here in this picture in the, uh, in the room. But uh, within this Icelandic HPC community, we are processing, uh, we can say, a number of uh, different types of data. But uh, we have focused also very much on simulation and, and remote sensing on data. We have a special data lab, simulations and data lab for remote sensing. And it is led by uh, Professor Morris Riedel, who will arrive tonight, Gabriele says, and will be with you uh, after that. And uh, what we are looking at, we have strongly collaborated with ULIC Supercomputer Center. We have strong partnership in this. We have joint professorship. We have joint, uh, or joint, joint professorships, joint PhD students, access to cutting edge technology. And this has enabled long-term career chances. And this is something I would say is emerging field. And there will be a lot of opportunities in it in the future. And for example, what we, if we look at our joint uh, PhDs with ULIX Computer Center, uh, Gabriele Cavallaro here from 2016 has done very well, and, but we have had more and we continue to do, do this and several of them are in, in remote sensing. And currently we have about 10 PhD students and a few master students that are working on their thesis and several of them are in uh, remote sensing, but we can also say and uh, I often mention with remote sensing, I love research on remote sensing, but working on remote sensing, working on uh, super computing, or we can say high performance and disruptive computing, it can be much broader because we can apply these approaches on several different data. So this is something uh, that I would like to mention that, that there, are, there are so many opportunities associated with this field and this field is just emerging it is growing quite a bit hpc is needed for science and engineering the uh, landscape of hpc gets more complex day by day and there are a wide variety of great tools that exist for hpc but mastering the tool set is not trivial therefore we need to be on our toes and working in this field is a winner. So I wish you a great, uh, great summer school. Thank you, Dora and everybody involved in teaching here. It's a great pleasure to have you here and uh, welcome to the University of Iceland. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Janatli, for your kind introduction. So we'll now move to the, to the next talk. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody to, to this summer school. We are very really happy to have you all here and, and the persons who are attending online. Uh, we have uh, we had many, many, many more subscriptions that, that we expected. Uh, and many persons are, are attending at home, so we are happy. I'm going to give a brief overview of the summer school and the context, uh, the contents, and uh, some ideas and objectives of the of the summer school. And then Gabriel will continue explaining uh, some details. Well, as uh, Professor John Atlee Benedictson explained, 
the join field of high performance computing and remote sensing is a gain wave and is becoming very relevant during the last year. So we are here trying uh, to uh, network, to make networking with, with people involved in this area. Uh, the Summer of School is the second edition. This is the second edition of the Summer of School. We will continue during the next, during the next years and it's organized by the working group uh, of I Tripoli, GRSS, Aeroscience, Informatica, Technical Committee. In particular, for the, we are uh, the, the chairs of the group of high performance and disruptive computing in remote sensing inside the Technical Committee EASI, as Ajong Adli uh, pointed out uh, some, a few minutes ago. Well, we, we have to to say thanks to all the persons participating in the course and involved in supporting economically and with a participation in the course, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and other partners. We will see uh, all the people during these days. Well, first of all, I want to say that I come from Spain, uh, from the University of Santiago de Compostela. I'm teaching there and I'm, uh, during the last 10 years, I have been doing research in the combined field of remote sensing, high performance computing, image processing, machine learning, all applied to remote sensing. Uh, I lead uh, there a small group of, of persons. Some of these persons will teach tomorrow morning, explaining some applications of high performance computing to remote sensing problems, to particular remote sensing problems. First of all, we, we need to go to the origin and well, we all know what remote sensing is, but we can, uh, we should uh, remember that remote sensing can be applied at different levels. Remote sensing is, observe, is observing an object without physical contact using different kinds of sensors. And we have observed at large distance, for example, with, uh, with an artificial satellite, uh, as in the in the in the left part of the uh, of the slide, and we can observe at short distances using a UAU, a sensor on a UAU, of, or uh, even uh, using a camera in a room with a doctor observing, for example, the skin or the fundus uh, of the eye. So remote sensing can be applied at different levels and with in many many different fields, and we can. Uh, we should uh, have into, into consideration uh, the observation made uh, from John at least uh, a, few, a few minutes ago uh, related to the application of solutions to different levels uh, of remote sensing. Solutions that are valid for uh, satellite uh, Im images obtained from satellites are also applicable to, to other fields. And there are many fields of application of remote sensing. We know some of them because they are very popular. All the applications related to Earth observation, we are working basically on these fields of application, but remote sensing can be applied to, uh, for example, with biomedical uh, objectives, or for example, for civil protection, for smart cities, uh, for uh, urban planning, for different, for different applications. Um, uh, the sensor has been uh, made more and more affordable during the last uh, years. So it's been uh, applied to many, many fields uh, also during the last years. Uh, we can obtain uh, images from the Earth during the, uh, through different missions. Uh, we, we obtain data every day all over the world from the uh, Earth's surface, but also from the atmosphere, atmosphere, and it's a, an opportunity, a unique opportunity to extract information and solve very uh, interesting problems with a, a whole view of the problem, because we have data enough to solve big problems. And we are involved in this uh, problem of extracting knowledge from this information from all this information. And this information is available for everybody uh, through uh, space agencies, for example, uh, and 
uh, how we, how we can process this information. We have to store uh, this uh, big amount of information. We have to transmit. We have to label this information. We have to process the information and using, in some cases, very complex algorithms. And these complex algorithms need, need to be computed, uh, in some cases, in real time. And in another cases, the problem is so complex that uh, uh, a PC, uh, as, as usual, uh, is, is, not, is not a good solution. So we have to use new approaches for solving these problems. And this is the point when high performance computing and all the, of the emergent, um, emergent computing paradigms can be applied to remote sensing. Well, the Geoscience and Remote Science Society that was probably introduced, uh, basically uh, is focused on developing concepts and techniques for remote sensing of the Earth, trying to solve problems related to the Earth, oceans, atmosphere, and space, uh, trying to obtain solutions, uh, and the number of uh, researchers involved in this uh, society is increasing every year because the interest, the economical and the research interest on these subjects is increasing also every year. These are the different committees that John Atlee also, uh, also explained before. And we are involved in this group of high performance and disruptive computing uh, applied to uh, remote sensing inside the Earth Science Informatic, Informatics Committee. This committee uh, includes two working groups. We are on the left in the slide. Uh, this uh, working group was created uh, in 2021, at the beginning of, the, of 2021, uh, just in the middle of the pandemic situation. And one year later was created, uh, the other group was created, databases in remote sensing. So we both groups propose activities inside the technical committee, trying to promote uh, different uh, um, opportunities to, net, to make networking uh, between young researchers, uh, senior researchers, students, and trying to increase the knowledge of these computing technologies. Well, uh, I'm in the middle, uh, Jin Sung is not here, uh, but Gabrielle will have organized most part of this, of this summer school, you know, uh, you all know him and he will continue in a few minutes with, with this presentation. This is the working group, the basic idea, the main objective of this working group is connect and support a community of interdisciplinary researchers in different fields uh, and basically apply all the knowledge that we have in computing paradigms to remote sensing. The idea is to compute efficiently these problems of remote sensing and uh, this is necessary at the point, uh, we will see uh, tomorrow uh, and, and today different examples. For example, uh, today we will see different big uh, projects uh, that use big amounts of data that need to be processed in this, uh, in this efficient way with the um, idea of solving problems in, in a general way with application, with different applications. Well, uh, only for introducing these high performance computing um, subject, uh, we see here one very uh, well-known uh, graph in, in our field. This person is Gordon Moore, and he said in 1964 that uh, one trend will be followed during, uh, he said one trend will follow during the, the next years. Uh, we can see in the orange points, uh, showing an evolution that was predicted by him. The number of uh, transistors in, a, in an unity of area of a chip uh, is doubling each couple of years. And the performance of uh, one uh, microprocessor, a single, thread, a single thread processor, is supposed to evolve at the same pace that the number of transistors. 
Uh, as you can see, uh, looking at the green points, uh, this is not a reality because from 2003 uh, until now, uh, the curve is flattening uh, as a consequence of the increasing in power consumption of the transistors because we are talking about CMOS transistors and they uh, need uh, a considerable uh, amount of, of power consumption. So it's necessary to reduce the frequency, as you can see also uh, in, the, in the graph, to maintain the power at a reasonable level uh, for uh, the, the usual ways of dissipating heat in our, um, in our chips. So as a consequence of this reduced uh, reduction in frequency, it's necessary to increase the capability of computing using other different uh, techniques. Uh, for example, using in parallel different computing elements. Uh, this is the origin of the parallels and is the way of achieving good performance at this moment. This was the, the beginning of parallelism around uh, the year 2000. And this is the origin of all the high performance computing. High performance computing is uh, usually used as a synonym of supercomputing. It's a way of using many, many nodes or cores computing in parallel using different computing paradigms. Uh, distribute memory or shared memory computing. We will see examples uh, tomorrow and, and the main ideas, but uh, this uh, high performance computing and emerging computing paradigms extend to other uh, kinds of computing. For example, using a specialized hardware computing, using accelerators, GPUs, as we will see also tomorrow and on Wednesday, a specialized hardware computing, for example, FPGAs that use on board. Uh, quantum computing is another very interesting paradigm that is gaining interest. And one day of the course will be uh, fully dedicated uh, to quantum computing on Thursday. Edge computing, quantum computing is also one of the relevant paradigms because offers possibility, possibilities uh, and flexibility that a data center is uh, not able to provide. And other computing paradigms, for example, blockchain, that it's very interesting to maintain the chain in uh, the uh, uh, communication of data between different servers, trying to check the reliability uh, of the data that is transmitted. So different, this all, all this emerging parallel, parallel and uh, uh, different computing paradigms uh, need to be applied for solving different problems. And we will focus in two or three of them during this course. And the summer school of the next years will, will continue uh, with this task. In particular, if you are interested in you know our vision of these uh, computing paradigms and the, and the role of these paradigms in, in the research today, you can read this, uh, uh, this paper that was written by, by us with all their colleagues, by Gabriele and me and Tevin Gu and all, all other colleagues. We can read the, na the names here in the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing magazine. And uh, in this paper, we explain the basic ideas, the state of the art in research today, and the open challenges for the future. Uh, and we, we consider that it's a good starting point for explaining the objectives of uh, the group. And if you are interested in coming aboard, of course, if you are interested in asking me something or Gabriele, we will be available this year, during these days here and uh, all, our, all the information to contact us is in, in the web page of the, of the course, of course. And you can join uh, the technical committee as uh, Professor John Adley uh, pointed out. It's very interesting to be part of this a working group. Well, the past activities of the, of the group uh, during the last year were basically focused first on the first summer school last year. 
and it was a success with with many students here and attending from home and uh, the topics were basically uh, quantum computing gpus and accelerators and machine learning uh, using cloud computing these were the the topics and we had also the support from different organizations as, uh, as you can see and especially uh, the support of the of the university of of iceland uh, we also organized uh, two tutorials at igars uh, the the big conference on remote sensing and you can see all the details too in the in the web page uh, this presentation will be available uh, through the, the YouTube channel of URSS, but you can also take notes if, if you if you want. And we also uh, organized an invited session on data intensive computing for remote sensing, and we had the presentations that are detailed here are all of them are available and if you want uh, more details or the full text of any of these of these contributions you can contact us uh, basically uh, we uh, talked about deep learning registration of multispectral and hyperspectral images on gpus uh, cloud quantum, quantum computing uh, classification problems as you know, all the problems related to machine learning and deep learning are uh, very active at this moment, uh, are uh, problems that are being uh, working during the, the last few years intensively. So they were included also here. And we have uh, been part of one workshop called Searching a Mining Large Collection of US Spatial Data, GeoSearch, also during the last years uh, with, with many, with older colleagues in the area. And uh, Gabriele will explain the current activities and details of the course. Uh, thank you again for, for being here. And uh, I'm available for, for any question that you want uh, there during the coffee or by email or during the lunch or when you want. Thank you very much. Yeah, I will just very, very fast before we have our coffee is already there. I can see it. So um, let's start with say some words about the current activities that we have. Um, we will start already with the topic of quantum computing. So here we have a, a current special issues on the uh, on the J on the Journal of Selected Topics in Applied Earth Observation and Remote Sensing, J Stars. Um, the uh, issue is running until the end of the year. So, you know, if you uh, feel free to, you know, to check it out. And if you have contribution, of course, they will be very welcome. Here we have the link also at the bottom. Uh, and, you know, it could be anything that, you know, uh, includes the usage of this new paradigm, quantum computing, applied to any type of application that you can imagine uh, in, in a remote sense. So that would be the first one. Then we have, of course, again, organized a tutorial uh, and invite a session at the next IGERS conference, hopefully in person. Uh, so we have here on the left side, we have invite a session to actually one more related to quantum machine learning algorithms for Earth observation. And the second one more about at the intersection between uh, HPC and, and quantum computing. So this will be the two sessions we have uh, invited speakers and uh, hopefully the program will be available on the website of IGERS in the next in the next weeks so you can have a look what are going to be the, the, the papers uh, we are also organizing tutorials uh, again tutorial we take two two of these topics the first one is again is about how to handle machine learning pipelines through uh, high performance computing to cloud computing so a full processing pipeline and in this case students will have access first to our hpc systems at the ulish uh, so we're going to be center where they will do the, the training by using multiple GPUs. And then the training model will be then do transfer to cloud computing resources to do inference. So you can see how this pipeline could work and students will have the possibility to do this uh, practically. Then we have also another um, uh, tutorial, which is most about 
thesis guided and quantum artificial intelligence for observation. This will be given by Niaidatku, Professor Niaidatku, uh, who also will give you a very nice overview of this uh, new paradigm. Then, of course, this summer school is the current event happening right now. And I think you already kind of understood what is our mission here. So we want really to make a network of different uh, students, professor, postdoc, anyone who is really interested in uh, the application of uh, computing paradigms, anyone, anything, basically, as you can see here, supercomputing, blockchain, neuromorphic computing, maybe in the future, who knows, uh, cloud computing, quantum computing, anything applied specifically to remote sensing applications. So this is our unique, let's say, uh, selling point, or if you want to, to mention it more like uh, our, you know, specialization. We There are many groups, many activities around the world focusing on supercomputing or cloud computing. But here we're just interested in at the application of these paradigms for specifically application in remote sense. So this is what we're really trying to do. And hopefully with the summer school, we will grow. And also we will make sure that the community of student, professor, anyone who's really interested will be connected. And you know, hopefully we will also have more activities. So this is just the beginning, hopefully. So uh, before the coffee break, the agenda, you already saw the agenda, of course, let me go through very fast. So you see we're already here at the coffee, the first coffee break, which will last half an hour. Um, and today we will have uh, then other talks that will be given remotely. Um, as you know, some speakers will be uh, provide lecture remotely, some speakers are here. Uh, and you see we'll start at 11 o'clock with uh, Bertrand Lesseau from ISA, which will give you an overview of the current um, yeah, activities uh, in, in the context of quantum computing for Earth observation. Then we will have lunch break, hopefully, uh, here outside. So the lunch break, coffee breaks, everything is outside here, so we don't need to walk too, too, too far. Uh, and after that, we start with uh, Claudia Vitolo from ESA, also I will, uh, who will introduce the project Destination Earth, which just started, and you will see a bit of, you know, uh, what are the, uh, let's say, um, the challenges that this project is going to face uh, and how it's going to need these computing capabilities uh, a lot. Finally, in the, we'll have in the last part, Tom Auskopinger from Microsoft, uh, who will talk about geospatial data analysis with the Microsoft Planetary Computer. This will be a very interesting project also, and you will see also here how uh, this technology plays an important role. From eight to 10, we will have our social dinner. I will give you more details later here. There is also a form to fill, uh, but this will be offline uh, later on. Okay, so tomorrow, Tuesday, 31st of May, we will have uh, uh, two uh, uh, people coming from the University of Santiago de Compostela. And here we will enter more into focus into details about as you see, uh, processing, for instance, the first talk by Pablo, hyperspectral processing on shared memory system using OpenMP. And you will see, if you know, don't know what it is, you will get familiarized with this topic. Um, then we will go with Alvaro uh, on comparing different HPC solutions for registration of multispectral remote sensing images. So when you have to align different bands. And afterwards, we will go more into H the HPC, so pair computing topics with uh, Rocco Sedona, who is actually here. And Marcel Act, who is another, another PhD student of us. Uh, and here we will enter more into the domain of distributed deep learning, high performance, uh, with high performance computing. And we will see also a bit of information of this Corais project, uh, which uh, yeah, was also uh, having the mission of really working on supercomputing for different applications. Wednesday, June 1st, uh, we will now uh, enter then in more, again, specialized computing. We will have Raul Guerra, who is going to be on site. Uh, he's arriving tonight. Um, and he will talk about, as you see here, GPU parallel model for uh, computational uh, demanding task, but also nice application with UAV. Uh, with UAV. Uh, in the afternoon, we're going to have, uh, we're very happy to have people from uh, NVIDIA uh, who will talk about uh, uh, fueling the artificial intelligence evolution uh, with gaming. And you will see a very interesting topic there. Finally, uh, the last day, we have Thursday, June 2nd, we have uh, Piotr Gavnon is here in the room and Alexandra, um, who will talk, basically will just drive you all day long in the context of uh, quantum computing. So it will be very interesting, full day. So I hope you will uh, get uh, 
you know, an idea of what are the possibilities with this new computing paradigm. 10.30, very good, we are on time. So thank you very much again for being here. Uh, it's very nice to be in a room with people uh, after you know, a lot of time spent in, in the bedroom. Um, so I know this event, you see here many partners, of course, you know, GRSS for fully you know, funding this and also make you coming here. Um, University of Iceland, welcome us here. Race project, you will learn about the race project. The ESA, um, NVIDIA, Microsoft was also part of the program. Thank you very much. So, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you today, even if remotely. I guess I would have preferred to be in the same room, but we'll do the, the way we get used to in the last, uh, the last years. Okay. I'm ready, Gabriele. Do you want to, to make an intro? Or? This stage is yours. So Bertrand Lesseau from uh, ESA, he will talk about today the ESA uh, Fee Lab initiative on quantum computing for observation. Very interesting project, very relevant for what you're doing here. So uh, really welcome uh, you, Bertrand. Uh, maybe next time, hopefully on site. Uh, thanks a lot. The stage is yours. Thanks very much, Gabriel. So, uh, as you see uh, already on screen, and uh, as Gabriel introduced, I will talk about quantum computing. So, one of the, the key topics of, uh, of this summer school dedicated to Earth observation. Um, but actually, not only quantum computing, you'll see that later. Um, so, first, I wanted to, to present a bit. Uh, what is the ESA Lab and what is S3? I guess everyone knows uh, ESA, the European Space Agency. S3 is uh, the Earth Observation Center located in Italy, near Rome, in Frascati. And we are dealing with everything <coughs> that is Earth Observation and, the, for instance, uh, the, the download or the processing of uh, the Sentinel data from Sentinel 1, Sentinel 2. That I guess many of you are already using daily. Um, we've seen Esrin. The ESA Philab is a very particular uh, laboratory, a division of uh, the Earth Observation Program. Our mandate is to accelerate the future of Earth Observation. That is basically that we are looking to everything that can be new in terms of digital technologies, and we, we see how we can apply them to, um, to Earth observation use cases. And this goes from something very fundamental, just discovering, having blue sky ideas, then uh, feed these ideas, make them grow uh, in order to, to sustain the, and to, uh, the, the European ecosystem and to, to help uh, entrepreneurs uh, new companies, emerging companies in uh, this kind of uh, new tech uh, that can, uh, uh, let's say, develop new ways to process observation data. And uh, to do that, the, the FILAB uh, stands on two legs. Uh, first one is the Explorer Office, uh, to which I'm belonging to, and I will talk about that uh, in the following. And the other leg is uh, the Philab Invest Office. And uh, this is uh, um, mostly the, the office operating the Incube program. Incube is uh, something that is absolutely great, absolutely new in uh, the European ecosystem in the sense that it, the, the goal is really to, to help uh, emerging companies to develop their business, to go from de-risking to product development, and, uh, and then to, to be able to, yeah, to, to just have the, the company life, uh, to, to, to sell products, to, to find customers. So we're really um, participating in the, the emergence of these new companies. And maybe you have one of those companies, so I suggest that you can look for this kind of program. But if I'm focusing more on the Explore Office, so the, let's say the more research-oriented 
office in the field lab, what we do is uh, to, to look at new digital technologies. You see a lot of them uh, on the slides right now. It goes from IoT, digital twin stuff, quantum computing, of course, but also HPC, uh, and of course, artificial intelligence. And we try to, to connect to people, to connect people together, uh, to find new technologies, to apply, for instance, these new technologies versus observation use cases. And, uh, and the idea is that maybe we, we, are, we are helping building the future and then transfer to our uh, other, uh, other departments of ISA or something that goes more into production. So what we have in mind, on, I mean, I'm talking a lot about digital technologies, but always we keep in mind that uh, what we are interested in is uh, this little blue planet. I guess that uh, lots of people here have uh, lots of interest uh, in that planet, um, which have, we, which has to, to face a lot of, um, of, let's say, challenges. It goes from, um, from climate change, but also, I mean, globalization, lots of, uh, of things for I know, security, also sustainability. So there are lots of sad challenges to be faced. And the, maybe one of the, the good things today is that we have uh, a huge network of uh, observing devices in orbit around the Earth. And those devices, those satellites, they allow us to take the pulse of the planet uh, in many ways. Many, many types of sensors, and uh, very often, daily, even for some of them. So to process all this information, of course, we need new, um, maybe new technologies, new ways of processing all the information because now it goes beyond the, the human capacity. And uh, AI, of course, is one of, uh, of the main drivers in the revolution of Earth observation. And um, this is, of course, what we are missing mostly. Uh, and it goes for, for many things. The process of data, just the automation of the processes, but also for onboard sensing and processing, for instance. Uh, also a lot of statistical stuff for data science, but also image processing, like super resolution, image enhancement, and so on. And of course, I mean, going from raw data to uh, products which have uh, a human uh, interest, like maps, indicators of whatever you want. Uh, this is really the, the power of AI. So this is happening today, but tomorrow, maybe we, we need something else. And something else might be quantum computing for Earth observation, actually, uh, maybe even more AI enhanced quantum computing. So that is the, the combination of AI on quantum computing for optimization, for instance. And this uh, could be in 10, 20 years, the, the next paradigm. So this is exactly the, the topic uh, of this talk today. Um, and of course, this is uh, driven by uh, some uh, huge needs uh, that we, we are planning for also for, for the next decades, uh, among which there is a Destination Earth initiative. So maybe you've heard of that. This is an initiative by the European Commission that will be implemented uh, by ESA, but also partners uh, in Europe like SEMWF, UMEDSAT. And basically the idea is to have this big digital twin of the Earth. Uh, so lots of data, uh, to be put together, lots of analysis to be processed. And uh, of course, AI will be uh, like the glue that will help to, to make things stand together. But AI might not be enough, and maybe HPC, quantum will also be needed. So in today's talk, I will uh, address, uh, let's say, the, the three axes we are um, uh, we are pursuing right now for quantum computing for you. First, I mean, this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, brainstorming, uh, thinking of what uh, QC4EO could be, should be, maybe. 
Uh, I will also delve in some uh, research projects and activities that we have around uh, quantum computing and quantum machine learning. And finally, I will, uh, I will say a few words about uh, the network we are uh, building right now, and maybe you will be also part of it in the near future. So first, I mean, what I want to talk about is uh, quantum computing and maybe its application to Earth observation. And uh, just to, to have, uh, I mean, that we, we share all the, the same ideas, I, I wanted to, to have this kind of, uh, of uh, historical view of uh, the quantum computing that basically was born uh, 40 years ago, from, went from concepts to the first algorithms like in the first 20 years, then we had the first quantum computers around the year 2K, and with more and more qubits as, a, as time is going on. Uh, 10 years ago, there was a first commercial quantum device, the, the famous uh, annealer by D-Wave. Um, and now we are uh, in, a, in a, a period that is uh, very particular, uh, the time of uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum computer. So basically we have com quantum computers with a few qubits, like 50, 100, uh, if you're looking last uh, IBM uh, results. Um, we have also a lot of uh, technologies which are appearing and competing. So one of them maybe will, will, be, uh, will be the standard of tomorrow. Uh, and this means this particular uh, NISC era is very exciting in my opinion because now we can start to do some stuff. That is, we have the algorithms, we have the, the hardware, and now we can um, we can run algorithms on real software, on real hardware, real computers, and maybe have early proof of concepts of what uh, quantum computing could be. And so the, the questions we have now, um, especially, I mean, I have a background in uh, machine learning, so I'm very interested in that, but uh, we have seen in the last years also the, the emergence of quantum machine learning. And uh, this is time to find real life applications of quantum, uh, quantum machine learning. Of course, there are some of them which might be the, the most relevant, maybe just due to the, the quantum uh, nature of the phenomena that are, uh, that are uh, studied, like drug design, uh, novel material discovery. And uh, the question that uh, we're asking ourselves now is, can we use that also for general purpose data processing? And by general purpose data, I mean, uh, for instance, Earth observation, since of course this is uh, also another center of interest of mine. So actually in the quantum computing field today, there are many open questions. Maybe uh, the most important of, uh, of them is the first one. Is there any problem that quantum computing could solve more efficiently? That is, is, is there the possibility of a quantum advantage by using quantum computers? Uh, this is still a debate. Uh, we hope so, of course. Um, but maybe if, uh, I mean, we can wait for, for a few years more to, to have answers to that. But uh, especially, I think that today, one of the, the key questions is uh, to redefine the kind of advantage that can be expected. So for a long time, for instance, uh, speed up on the scalability of uh, of quantum algor of algorithms by applying quantum computing has, uh, has been the focus. But maybe now it's moving to something else to find different solutions, better modeling of some phenomena. Uh, also in terms of energy efficiency, maybe uh, tomorrow quantum computers could, be, uh, could bring some advantage. Um, if I'm uh, focusing more on my problems of Earth observation, uh, we have a few more peculiar questions like how to use quantum computing to bring a quantum advantage to EO. Uh, like for instance, what kind of EO problems 
for which maybe we have a solution already, we have an algorithm, can be solved faster or better by quantum computing. And uh, of course, optimization uh, of some, some system can be uh, relevant, but also maybe uh, for machine learning, we can find something, something better. Also, we, I mean, we are in the NISC area, uh, in the NISC era, sorry. Um, and of course, um, quantum computers right now, they are not able to, to compete with the clusters of GPUs where you can apply deep learning. So maybe also a question we, we have to answer quite soon is to, to see how we can operate quantum computers along with clusters, supercomputers, various kinds of, uh, of, of devices on, to, to get the best of, uh, of an hybrid computing uh, setup. And uh, of course, the, this is a question that uh, also everyone is asking himself is, when will this happen? So to answering all of these questions, or this is, uh, I mean, we're discussing with a lot of people. I, I, will, I will show you a bit the kind of network we, we built in the, the last year. Uh, but recently, we issued this invitation to tender. ITT, in the jargon of ESA, is a, basically a call for project. Uh, and the objective of this invitation to tender is uh, to, to answer all these questions. Uh, basically, identifying use cases which are relevant to the EO domain, for which quantum computing could, be, could bring an advantage. Uh, also have uh, ideas about the kind of uh, quantum algorithms, uh, also quantum hardware, which could uh, be uh, leveraged to solve these use cases. And then, uh, uh, I mean, establish a kind of roadmap of, uh, for, for the next years. Also, when I say roadmap, also th I'm also thinking of a timeline to which this roadmap can be implemented. And so this is, like I said, uh, a call for project. It is open. Uh, the deadline was recently extended until uh, mid-June. So, I mean, if you're part of, I mean, if you are EO expert or quantum expert, on that you, you know the, the right people to maybe easier to answer yourself, but also to form a consortium. Maybe you can uh, just uh, go to this URL, doing business uh, with ISA, uh, and try to, to submit a proposal for, for this uh, ITT. Um, second, uh, I wanted to, to discuss a bit, I mean, because in the future, we'll have the roadmap, we will have maybe more uh, consequent projects. But uh, right now, we are not uh, inactive, actually. We have already some exploratory activities, mostly centered around uh, quantum machine learning. Uh, last year, already, we had uh, this uh, project with, uh, I mean, quite internal, also with uh, uh, University of Sanyo professors about the classification of EO data with quantum neural networks. In uh, this year, we started a few projects uh, which uh, were actually selected through a campaign we had on the OSI platform of, uh, of ISA. Um, here you see the URL also, um, ideas.isa.int. And uh, I also encourage you to, to bookmark this URL because I mean, the campaign about quantum information processing is closed, but maybe uh, this is a, we have this discovery element where uh, academics can provide, uh, I, mean, I mean, can submit ideas which can be co-funded uh, up to 90 euros by ISA. So this is uh, maybe a good way to, to collaborate with us. For, this can be for, of course, PhD students, but also for postdocs. On last year in the quantum information processing campaign, uh, we first selected a, a few, uh, few ideas. Uh, the first one is uh, quantum machine learning for classification of EO data. Uh, we had also a project with CERN about generative modeling of EO data. So discriminative, generative, and <clears throat> last but not least, hybrid supercomputing quantum processing that is 
the intrication of quantum processing with, within a supercomputer with also lots of, uh, of devices. So if I go a bit uh, more into the details, uh, first proof of concept last year led by uh, two students, Alessandro Sebastianelli from, uh, I mean, Internal to Fila, but also uh, a student at the University of Sanio uh, in Benevento, Italy, and uh, a young student from MIT, Daniela Zeidenberg. And uh, they, they just did a, a great job because basically what, what they, they tried was to, to implement this kind of hybrid quantum classical neural network. So basically a neural network, but with a quantum circuit at the end, because of course we, we cannot, uh, um, I mean, quantum circuits are uh, really small. We only have a few qubits. So basically you have uh, to pre-process the data to reduce the dimension first. And then we had this quantum circuit with a, a bit of entanglement. And the idea was to look if uh, this kind of uh, network was able to compete with the standard neural networks of the same complexity. And I think it was a very good surprise because uh, so we tested that on the, the, the Eurosat data set. So Eurosat is a, a data set with a long, I mean, uh, Sentinel-2 images uh, on long cover labels. And this is so for image classification. Uh, and actually we were able to, to reach very good results, uh, even with a nice architecture like a course to fine a classifier, uh, something that is at the same level as you can see here of 97% uh, accuracy <clears throat> on the last row. That is very, I mean, like the state of the art with some neural networks. So basically, hybrid quantum classical neural networks uh, are working and can be used for this kind of task. So this is, of course, interesting because we are not here using about, uh, uh, we are not discussing about some, uh, let's say, laboratory experiments. This is actually a real, uh, real life use case. <clears throat> On this kind of classification network, can then be used, for instance, for long cover mapping. Here on the, the figure, you can see the kind of uh, map you can obtain uh, when compared to uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, deep learning networks. So this was uh, actually a very good, uh, very good surprise and a very good, I mean, something that uh, pushed us to, to continue in that direction. And, uh, so we have these, these three projects, actually uh, two PhDs on the a postdoc. First one is uh, Su Yon Chang. So she's uh, with the ETFL in Switzerland on the, the CERN, and this is a, a CERN lead project. Uh, and here, the idea is uh, also always uh, quantum machine learning, but to go beyond this kind of discriminative classification but to go to something that is really generative modeling. So really understand what is the distribution of Earth observation data. Um, here, I mean, we have uh, a lots, of, uh, lots of challenges to, to tackle. Um, and actually we are trying to tackle them the one after the other. So first thing, Earth observation data, like lots of real life use cases, they have huge dimensions. So, in order to fit them to a quantum device, you have to, to reduce this dimension to, to encode that in something that is, uh, that is tractable. Uh, then even after uh, dimensionality reduction, you have to transfer the classical data to the quantum device. And here you have all this kind of data embedding problems. And finally, of course, if you want to, to to have something that is parameterable as a neural network, as, as a, a machine learning um, uh, algorithms, you have to find uh, a quantum circuit that, uh, that you can optimize and that can uh, find the, uh, I mean, perform the, the task uh, efficiently. And uh, so here we, we propose values, uh, I mean, we tried actually values uh, setups uh, from, uh, just like feature extraction, then embedding, then simple quantum classifier. Now we have moved to uh, uh, 
uh, also something that is optimized uh, all in all. So that is an hybrid model with uh, classical parts and quantum parts. So this is this kind of uh, encoder decoder that is purely classical, but with, uh, in the same time, a, a quantum neural network for the classification. This is what you see in the image. And actually, it is working quite well. I mean, there are lots of, uh, of tests on trials and errors, but we are progressing uh, uh, at a quite good pace. Um, basically, in a, a paper that will be presented uh, at IGAR this year, uh, we have uh, this kind of results with lots of uh, I mean, binary classification, for instance, of long cover. Uh, this is something we are able to achieve. And uh, now with our hybrid model, we're also able to, to learn. So really have a, a variational uh, circuit that is able to learn uh, the multi-class uh, comparison, uh, comparison uh, uh, classification. And we, with quite good results. So this is, of course, uh, the first step. Building a classifier, this is a half uh, a generative adversion network, but basically this is what we have uh, in mind for the, for the future, to be able to, uh, to have generative modeling, generative neural network, which are able to not only uh, classify data, but also generate new data, also perform out of distribution or anomaly detection. And uh, this is what uh, Suyan Chang is working in. Right now, another project is um, about uh, the intrication of um, of uh, quantum computing with supercomputing. This is uh, run by Hamir Deli Basic uh, from uh, I mean, who is uh, student at the University of Iceland, Iceland, but uh, also. Uh, Spending most of, most of his time at, at uh, first and from Julish with uh, Gabriele Cavallaro. I don't have to present, I guess. Um, and in this project, basically, the, the idea is uh, to look for the optimal implementation of, uh, of uh, a real life uh, use case processing uh, on various devices, various computing devices. So maybe, for instance, you can have uh, a problem that is best solved on a, a D-wave quantum annealer, on a, an emerging quantum device. On this part of the, the world pipeline should be dealt on this kind of devices. But maybe other parts, like image encoding, should be run on a, a cluster of the uh, cluster of GPU, cluster of CPUs, on a supercomputer, maybe also for running some emulation. So basically, the idea to see how all these hardware, uh, hardware devices can uh, talk each, uh, uh, each one to another and to find the, the best architecture. And uh, this is, uh, so for the moment, what, um, what Amer is doing is to take advantage of this unique European facility that, uh, that is uh, the D-Wave uh, quantum annealer that has been installed uh, at Jolish. Uh, and the idea is to, to formalize the problem of classification of your data. So for instance, here on this uh, data set, like I mean, urban uh, classification with water, buildings, vegetation, etc., etc. See how you can formalize this problem in a problem that can be optimized on the quantum annealer, like Cubo, uh, and find uh, a kind of quantum algorithm that can solve it. And here also, we, we, are, we are facing, I mean, discovering and facing uh, new problems uh, each time because, I mean, for instance, always, as always, memory is a, a key and a critical uh, issue. Uh, in, uh, in using quantum algorithms, since uh, we are very limited with respect to that. Um, so this is going on. Uh, I guess uh, there will be uh, more and more results along the years, but uh, already Amer will, pre will be presenting the, the first results uh, he has done 
uh, at IGAS this year. Last project is about, uh, again, quantum neural networks for spectral information processing. So this is a pro project uh, run by uh, postdoc Manish Gupta uh, at uh, Nicholas Copernicus Astronomical Center in, uh, in, uh, in Poland, in, in Varsovia. Uh, and this is run by, I mean, so also by Professor Piotr Gauron that uh, will, uh, will hold the, the, the course on quantum computing on Thursday. So don't miss that, of course. Uh, and the, the problem that uh, Manish is trying to tackle is uh, first to find uh, if there is some kind of setup on which quantum uh, can be useful for uh, in EO. And for instance, why should we use quantum neural networks, uh, rather than standard classification techniques for, for this kind of, of image. And the, one of the, the first studies they, they run uh, was to look for also a data set with, uh, with land cover classes. And first they encoded that uh, with um, quantum features and tried to classify then this kind of quantum features. And they discovered that not always, but sometimes, actually, you, you can find uh, a good advantage in using this kind of quantum feature. So it's in some, for instance, what you see here uh, on the left, the training accuracies. Uh, so for um, um, with and without using this kind of quantum features. So for training, basically, it is more or less the same. But we see that on a validation data set, actually with, um, with quantum features, we reach uh, much faster, some better accuracy. And in the end, after many epochs, uh, we have a clear, uh, a clear uh, uh, improvement in terms of accuracy. So this is only a proof of concept. This is only a first study. But uh, this is very promising. And uh, again, uh, Manish and Piotr uh, will uh, present uh, this work at IGAS 222. Uh, basically, all this work are presented in the, in the invited session that Gabriele and Dora have set up about disruptive computing. So if you're going to IGAS, uh, I encourage you not to miss that. And uh, I will be, I mean, looking forward to, to attending this session. So what's next? Basically, we are not uh, stopping here. We have uh, a few uh, new projects that uh, will start uh, this year in Poland, in Switzerland, also in Italy. Uh, and uh, maybe in uh, one or two years, I can present you new results about that. But basically, we are just extending the portfolio of our activities. So uh, I'm talking, uh, I've been talking for long, so I, maybe it's time that I speed up a little. Uh, I wanted to present you also the, the network of, uh, of people we, we are building uh, around Europe. Uh, and for this, I mean, we have, uh, so basically what, what is our aim here? It is to, to discuss with people, to, to brainstorm with people, uh, to, and also, I mean, to have people connecting together because I mean, this is not only an ISA and uh, ISA to someone, but ISA putting lots of people together and maybe uh, enabling things to happen. So, uh, and this is a map of Europe with uh, the, the people that uh, we've tried uh, to connect together. Um, in, uh, in blue, for instance, so you have the kind of co-funded research uh, I've talked about uh, in the previous slides. Um, basically, what we've done also is to organize workshops and events. As soon as uh, 2019, with uh, La Sapienza University in Rome, we, uh, we organized a, a first workshop on quantum processing. Last year, we paired up uh, with uh, Elis, so maybe you just present them. Basically, you have two uh, main 
societies for artificial intelligence and machine learning in Europe, Elise and Claire. We are actually we are discussing with both, but with Elise and especially with uh, Elise uh, Quantum on the physical space, the uh, machine learning unit. Uh, we organized this workshop, and the idea was also to, to bring people uh, from quantum computing to machine learning on the Earth observation to discuss the possibilities. Um, we had also sessions in our uh, few week, which is our ISA uh, annual event, usually held in Frascati. ISA, uh, as a whole, has also um, a quantum conference. Uh, it was the fifth, so basically, it encompasses more than Earth observation, of course, uh, because uh, telecommunications, quantum sensing, and so on, are of course uh, of, uh, of high interest and even more advanced than this kind of uh, <clears throat> general purpose data processing that I'm talking about. Uh, last week, there was a living, uh, living Planet Symposium in Bonn, and we had also an agora session on the future of computing, so a bit more than quantum, also about uh, supercomputing and uh, uh, also onboard processing. We had uh, Martin Balkovich from the CMWF, the head of computing. Lisa Werner that uh, is leading uh, a research group on quantum uh, on these very interesting quantum computing for climate at the LR and Chase Strong on the data analytics part in the ISI. Uh, ISI is uh, one of the European companies that is running uh, one of the major uh, constellations of satellites for so private, but uh, one of the European dragons in this uh, new space field. And we will continue in uh, 2022. So stay tuned for, for more. Um, we're also, of course, uh, discussing with the uh, organization, uh, with CERN, as, as I mentioned. We had also a discussion with, uh, um, with CERN, DLR, TU Munich, various kind of um, institutions. Uh, we are sponsorizing this summer school. We are very happy uh, to provide support for it. Uh, but also discussing with other like quantum open software, quantum climate initiative, uh, on what we had uh, also uh, in the last year is a special issue in IEEE J stars uh, about uh, quantum resources for Earth observation. On today, so this is news because it has not been uh, announced uh, elsewhere. So I'm very proud to that you get the, the primer for that. Actually, this JSTAR special issue is open until December 2022. So if you are working uh, currently in quantum computing for session, maybe you can submit a paper there. This is a, a very good venue to, to get uh, some, uh, I mean, to shed some light on, uh, on some new work in this emerging topic. And, uh, I mean, this was a special issue that, I mean, I'm guest edited with uh, Miai Datku, uh, who was uh, one of the pioneers of quantum computing for observation in Europe, but also with uh, Jacqueline Lemoyne from uh, NASA. So basically, this is some, something for uh, everyone uh, on this planet. So please submit. Uh, finally, and this is also an important message, we have uh, lots of uh, interactions with people. Also, the Phi Lab basically is a hub to welcome people uh, to, to work on, to spend a few days, for instance, uh, at ISA, at Esrin. Uh, we have very nice facilities. We have lots of uh, interesting people to, to discuss with. Uh, we have also uh, the blue sky on the sunny days, almost every day. Um, and actually, we are welcoming people. So, Miai that for instance, was with us uh, last year in October. Um, later this year, Gabriele or Piotr maybe might uh, make the trip here. We have currently a student from University of Warsaw also. He's a PhD student doing his thesis on quantum computing and he's uh, with us uh, until, the, until July. We'll have new students coming then. So maybe, I mean, yeah, I'm talking to you in the audience. Uh, you can be the next one. So just, I mean, get in touch, send me an email. And uh, if you're interested in applying your ideas to some kind of 
Association Use Case. We will be very pleased to, to welcome you for a few days, one month, two months, I don't know, and to have some kind, I mean, help you also in your, in your projects. So, time to conclude. So, basically, uh, so the idea to, to sum up a bit uh, everything that I've said, basically, what we are really trying to do um, today is uh, connecting people, linking people, and let people know that basically there are some capabilities in quantum computing, there are some problems in your association, and maybe by merging uh, all, the, all the, the good ideas, all the, the reflections, we can reach to, uh, to some uh, new solutions. And, uh, and so, of course, build uh, synergies. So, for the moment, this is, uh, let's say, uh, very, very preliminary because but this is also about identifying problems. But uh, what we really want to do is to be ready when uh, there will be a quantum computer with quantum algorithms which are able to to be used for applied problems. So by, um, by building this mutual awareness, we want to be ready for, for that moment. And it can happen maybe uh, in five years, maybe 10 years, 20 years, but the, the, the real uh, important thing here is, uh, is to, to be very fast when uh, we have this new, uh, this new kind of uh, capabilities. Of course, there are lots of uh, practical perspectives too, and maybe uh, even uh, at more short term. Um, of course, looking for practical applications, use cases. If you look at, uh, for instance, the quantum machine learning uh, literature, you'll see, of course, lots of theoretical works, but also a few applied problems, usually on NIST, so recognition of digits for image processing. Uh, and basically, the idea is that if you can do that for digits, of course, maybe you can do that with uh, more generic images, and of course, uh, Earth observation images. So also with uh, this kind of uh, exploratory activities, we want to, to understand better what kind of advantages we can, uh, we can have, faster, better solutions, better optimization. I don't know, but the answer uh, is uh, maybe uh, also for next year, for the next five years. And um, also, we want to understand how we can have a hybrid computing framework that will uh, merge all kind of compute means in order to, to, find, uh, to find optimal solutions to the problem we have. So, and this is my, la my last slide because, uh, before I leave you, the, leave you the floor to, to ask questions, if you have some. Uh, here are a few links. You can uh, learn more about us. You can uh, join ISA on ISA Philab. Uh, for instance, this is more for uh, artificial intelligence for you. Uh, but basically, we have a permanently open position at postdoc level. So if you're into AI, apply to a session, just uh, send your uh, application. We'll be uh, we would love to, to work with you. Also, as I said, if you're already engaged in a, a PhD or a postdoc, and uh, I mean, that it helps your projects to work with ISA, just uh, get in touch. And we can also maybe uh, welcome you here at ISA Philab. Uh, you have my email. And uh, I have a few minutes more to, to answer your questions. So you are welcome. Thanks a lot, Bertrand, for, uh, for this presentation and this very nice overview. Before we ask questions, do, do we have any applicants already for jobs? No? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm trying. So any question, please. Let me try to bring the microphone. Can you hear this, Bertrand? 
Petran, can you hear me? I'm not sure I'm hearing the... Are we here? Can you hear me? Yes, but this is okay. the desk uh, mic. Uh, we will have to come back. <laughs> Maybe I will tell as you will okay. please. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, when is this moment when you need to apply quantum algorithms for image classification or image segmentation problems? Because uh, from what I understood, understand, it's like it's difficult to improve the quality of classification with quantum algorithms. It's more about uh, improvement of speed and improvement of uh, performance uh like performance speed basically okay. uh, but then uh, with quantum computing you have a limitation of uh, the size of data you can process and uh, like where is this point where i should consider switching from classical algorithms for mm -hmm. image segmentation to quantum did you get the question Bertrand? no sorry uh, just okay. uh, so basically broken. what is the moment where you should consider to use quantum computing in your let's say application in your method so uh, we know that right there are some limitation still with the hardware um, we know that uh, this might also be uh, because you know there is this concept uh, that uh, quantum computing is just an accelerator which is of course uh, is not it is just a different type of computing program uh, so the question to you Bertrand is uh, when someone in this uh, crowd here or anyone or searcher should say, okay, now I should use quantum computing in my, in my work because dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Okay. This is a very good question, of course. Uh, and I have to say that if I had the answer, I don't know, I guess I would just uh, have my own startup and I will become rich in a few years. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, sorry, I, I don't have a clear answer to, to give you. What we are doing, uh, as I said, is, I mean, trying to be ready. So what does it mean? Uh, it means we are trying to first understand what are the problems in using this kind of uh, quantum devices. Uh, and as I said, there are already a few problems. Just reduce the dimensionality of data, embed, embed the, the classical data on a quantum device, because I mean, there is a little of technical uh, stuff to, to put them also here, depending, of course, on the, on the devices. Then the architecture of the circuits. So circuits are basically the kind of algorithms you can run on quantum computers. Uh, this is not a classical neural network for which you have PyTorch or TensorFlow. No, no. Here also, you have to devise everything by yourself. Uh, and then you have the, the reading out of the quantum device to get back to the classical world. So all these, all these steps are uh, raising new questions, new, uh, new issues. Uh, and we try to solve them because, of course, the dimensional reduction, even the embedding, actually, this is something that we, we can uh, discover uh, in, uh, tomorrow, how to do it the most efficiently. And what we want is to be ready for the moment uh, when some hardware producer, so it could be IBM, but also one of the, the many uh, emerging uh, startups like IonQ, uh, Candela, Pascal, and so much of them uh, also in Europe. When one of these manufacturers announce a quantum volume that is big enough to process uh, real data. Okay. Because if, I mean, when there is this announcement, basically the idea is not to be, okay, now there is this, we want to, to, to discover how to, to process or uh, applied use cases. No, we want to be ready for that. So everything else that is not quantum, we want it to be ready. So basically, this is uh, our process right now. Okay. Um, just to answer, for instance, the, the quantum volume, uh, if you are looking at the IBM roadmap, it is supposed to double every year. So a bit like uh, Moore's uh, law, but applied to quantum, Every year, IBM tries to, to double 
the, the quantum volume, so the quantum capacity of, uh, of the quantum devices. So actually, it is exponential. We know what exponential means. So quite soon, maybe we have uh, some device where you can run track. Uh, I mean, you can tractably solve some problems. I hope I answered the, the question, more or less. More or less. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, I think in the, the nutshell, we should be ready when then there will be availability of you know, new hardware uh, so that we are not, you know, we don't have to run and you know, make sure to make use them at the end. Any other question? Yes. So I see uh, on the side of Bertrand, everything is, I mean, it seems more experimental work. Experiment. On those metals. My question for him is how do you compare or do you benchmark fairly those metals with the classical ones? How do you benchmark what? The... Fairly. Fairly? Ah, okay. How do you make, uh, yeah, okay. So the question is how do you make a fair comparison between classical uh, methods from machine learning, for instance? Uh, with quantum uh, quantum approaches. So how do you establish this comparison? Okay, so sorry, uh, comparison between what and what? Basically, how do you establish a fair comparison between... Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, indeed, this is uh, a bit complicated. Usually, uh, what we try to do is to have networks of more or less similar complexity. Uh, so, for instance, because I mean, if you are using a very small uh, quantum networks, and you compare that to the less advanced, uh, the, the last advances of deep learning, maybe of course it's a bit unfair. So the idea, maybe first, is to, to try to to have something that is of similar complexity, but also actually when you are using. Uh, hybrid classical quantum uh, networks, uh, and this was the case with Eurosat uh, last year. And with Eurosat, it's not a very difficult data set. So basically the state of the art is around 97, 98% of good classification. And I think we are able to reach this level of classification also with uh, quantum algorithms, right. hybrid classical quantum algorithms. So basically, here, the, the thing is, we are also able to reach uh, the, the level of the best networks, but this is a very particular case. Uh, it would not be the same for every other set, of course. There was another question, I think. Two, okay. Uh, please. Uh, so, uh, have you been using quantum annealers also? And, uh, yeah, have you been using quantum annealers for the database? Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, what paradigms have you been using for the quantum annealers, or also gate-based? Um, yes, yeah, a very good question. Uh, so to answer quickly, uh, yes, we are using uh, quantum uh, annealers. And uh, actually, if you want more insight on that, I suggest uh, you discuss with Gabriele. Just simply as that, because uh, this is uh, the work that we at Philab uh, we are running with Gabriele and Hammer. Um, of course, I mean, this kind of, um, there are also in the literature uh, many works by uh, Solon Zobold, uh, Odin Bata, and uh, Mihai Dadku, uh, published in various uh, venues about applying this kind of, uh, of an email. So there are lots, uh, there are works. Uh, currently uh, going on uh, with this kind of uh, hardware, uh, quantum hardware. Um, more generally, I guess that uh, what we would like to achieve is to have a clear idea of uh, the possibilities that the, the various quantum hardware uh, have in order to process some kind of EO uh, information on EO data. So, also having the, the ability to, to compare these various devices and also the emerging devices like traditional quantum computers, photonics based, everything, this would be of high interest. Yeah. So we are a bit agnostic about, I mean, we, we don't have uh, 
let's say, uh, decided about one technology, but it is the best technology that is able to solve some problem uh, will be the, the, the best one. So we are studying all of them or want to study all of them. Yeah. Thank you, Bertrand. Please. So in the topic of generative adversarial networks, okay. he mentioned the challenge of the high dimensionality. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that that's more in the line of the classical thinking. So my question is, I wonder if quantum computing could um, overcome the course of dimensionality by instead of creating this uh, latent space going into um, uh, trying to explore the full dimension. Maybe you can come here to the <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bit too different to, to summarize. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I will fix the microphone later so we can. Yes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, nice to see you. Actually, it's better this way. Yeah, so uh, my question was just about the, the GANs. Uh, did you mention one of the challenges, which is the, the high dimensionality? And I know the current uh, challenge in the, the classical way of doing the uh, generative adversarial networks is that uh, you need to extract this the low dimensional representations. Um, but my, I wonder if quantum computing could actually exploit the full dimensionality in a different way that we're doing right now that's just creating this latent space. Uh, okay, this is a very good question. I mean, very precise also. Uh, actually, so, I mean, for everything I'm saying about, uh, everything is intuitions. Well, I mean, it is about intuitions, about uh, what, well, what you can see because everything is so preliminary. But in my opinion, generative modeling is something with a uh, lot of, uh, of promises. Um, so for, for, for instance, for, for GANs, yeah, I mean, the, the idea of GANs, um, like lots of generative models, the, the idea is to build a Latin space that is, of course, uh, much more uh, um, at much lower dimension than the original uh, distribution, the original space. So for images, not having all the pixels, but maybe only a few dimensions. Uh, but from those dimensions, you are able to generate new images. And you have actually captured everything that is necessary to create all the possible images. Okay. So, uh, what, uh, so there are two problems to distinguish. So this is something uh, that is inherent to every GAN or every native models. And so that is classical or uh, hybrid or quantum only. Um, what is interesting, and there are early works in the literature in the quantum machine learning literature about that, it's that is that maybe for some kind of problems like this, um, quantum computers are better at estimating the, the latent space on the latent distribution. Uh, for instance, um, uh, you at least seem to be uh, well aware of that. One of the issues of uh, classical generative uh, adversarial networks is that they, they suffer from mode collapse. So basically, you have provided them with samples, but from these samples, they are only able to, to learn the main modes of the distribution. And they are lacking, and they are missing uh, full, uh, full parts of the, of the distribution. And it seems, with early experiments, that quantum devices are able to, to learn in a, in a more complete way the, the latent distribution, and also that they are able to to reach and to learn that in a much faster way. So this would be, of course, I mean, if uh, it is assessed over and over uh, by experiments, this would be, of course, a great advantage. Uh, the paper I have in mind when I'm talking about that is a paper by, um, Uh, sorry, Canadian company uh, that is uh, developing uh, its own uh, Travion uh, device, uh, IonQ, 
So, um, so there are these kind of uh, interesting works uh, going on. So I hope that uh, we are also able to find, to reproduce them. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, thanks a lot. Any other question? Yes. Um, if it's long, come here. <laughs> if it is a long question, come here. Uh, it's a short okay. So I'm thinking, could you give an example about how difficult it is? Like, if you come from a remote sensing background, like, if, and you want to try to solve a uh, solve your problem while they are uh, quantum uh, computing, I feel like I like. For example, if I'm from a remote sensing background, I feel is you need to put lots of effort to understand quantum computing before you can actually uh, use it to solve your problem. Can you give an example about how kind of difficult that is? Um, for example, in your presentation that you use uh, the um, um, for the classification for a uh, use the QSA for uh, the length cover Okay, so it's about, um, um, okay, we have, we have background, maybe remote sensing. Uh, what is the effort that you have to make uh, to first, you know, understanding uh, quantum computing, right? And in order to be able then to, to do something practical. Um, so what is the, let's say, the... The entry way? ticket for that. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, what is the entry ticket to go from uh, standard computing with EO to quantum computing. Uh, this also is a good question. Um, especially if, uh, I mean, Gabriele, you said understanding quantum computing. So that, I think this is a very tricky one because I'm not sure that uh, there are lots of people who really understand quantum computing. Uh, people are also discovering what is computing as a, along with uh, playing with quantum devices. So this is uh, quite a difficult thing to achieve. Uh, but right now, what is uh, interesting is that, uh, I mean, for instance, you have the background in this observation, so you know how to process the data, you know also how to run PyTorch and so, so on. Today, we are in a moment where it's not so difficult to, to learn quantum computing and to apply that to your problems. First, you have uh, frameworks which are working very well with PyTorch and TensorFlow. Actually, you have already uh, a quantum version of TensorFlow. And with PyTorch, uh, you have uh, Penny Lane, you have Qiskit. So everything, all the quantum computing uh, main toolkits have uh, a, a, a Python interface and so you can run your standard code with this kind of, uh, of library. And uh, so, of course, this is um, very useful. Also, uh, you can have access quite easily uh, to some uh, quantum uh, devices uh, in the sense that, for instance, IBM is, uh, I mean, there is a waiting queue, of course, but IBM is providing uh, people with the ability to run code on their, uh, on their computers, on their quantum computers. Uh, maybe not the last Eagle one, the 127 uh, qubits uh, computer, but smaller computer, you, you can use them. And this is the same. You have lots of uh, quantum computers in the cloud by Intel, by uh, NVIDIA, and so on. So, uh, Actually, today you can try some stuff and you can also have uh, simulation softwares on your computer to see uh, if you would have uh, different results with a quantum, uh, quantum implemented version of your programs. I hope I answered your questions. Especially since Gabriel seems to have been <laughs> Have more questions? Any curiosity or, or any question? I only I, I have a question and a comment, Bertrand. Um, Please. It's, a, it's a philosophy uh, question because trying to compare 
a quantum version of a generative adversarial network, for example, with a classical one, is at some extent a, a way of limiting the quantum computing possibilities from my point of view. Shouldn't it be a more interesting to develop new deep learning algorithms, special, especially designed for quantum computing? Because if quantum computing is, a, yes, it's a new paradigm for programming, but has also can offer new possibilities that it's possible that are not well exploited trying to reproduce uh, the classical algorithms. Yes, uh, yeah, I completely concur with you. Uh, indeed, the, the kind of uh, statics, stat statistics that you can model on a quantum computer are different from the, the classical one different ways to handle the interferences between uh, phenomena, for instance. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so basically, this should be a revolution in uh, every field, in statistics, in machine learning, but maybe new algorithms uh, able to do stuff that we cannot do standardly. And also, the, the way it is implemented on, uh, on real devices, so dealing with uh, quantum mechanics and uh, quantum particles uh, phenomena. Uh, it is very difficult to have the, the grasp of everything at the same time, just because you would need to be, uh, I mean, Nobel Prize uh, in physics, uh, Fields Medal in statistics, maybe, to, to do all of this. So it's very difficult. So we are going step by step. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, one single person can uh, can really come with a solution for everything of that on a new theory of uh, all, in all these fields. But uh, by working together and by discussing with uh, experts in every domain, I guess uh, this is uh, maybe the, the way to, to advance uh, the, the knowledge and the, the science. Yeah, because I, I have the feeling it's only, it's only a, yes, a, a, a philosophical idea, yes. Mm. <laughs> In fact, but uh, I have the, the intuition that it, that new deep learning algorithms could, could, be, could be developed. But uh, of course, yeah. it's, a, it's a complicated, it's very complicated to, uh, because many fields are involved and, and it's possible that on Thursday, uh, here in, in the summer school, we, we can obtain new answers. I don't know if you have any answer to, <laughs> or any contribution to this discussion, if you want. Uh, uh, could you come here? Because if we, we have problems. Yeah, I would take that. One expert will, will discuss with us <laughs> for a few minutes. Thank you. Hi, hey, uh, how are you? you Hi. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice uh, yeah, so my response to that would be, let's use physics to build our artificial intelligence systems or machine learning systems. We do not have to focus on a particular way of computing that quantum computing brings, but we can, for example, think about using uh, the direct uh, mode of operating quantum computers, which I mean by just uh, steering the Hamiltonians of the systems, of these systems to program, to build our neural networks in, in a way. So that's something that is, uh, uh, I believe, very interesting because now we, we, okay, there are different paradigms of quantum computing, but we can think about just using the quantum systems in a way directly. And there are attempts to do that using photonics or using uh, superconducting qubits or using ions. So that's uh, something I, I would like to, to dive into and to see people, see people working on, because that is something that can bring really relatively quickly, really good uh, results. But at the same time, it is pretty complicated how to map our uh, practical problems from as observations, for example, to these uh, Hamiltonians of the, these devices. So there's quite a lot of fundamental work to uh, to do uh, in this area. 
but there are very good connections between mathematical description of uh, computing, quantum computing in, in particular, and machine learning. So tensor networks is a very good uh, tools of think, way of thinking uh, about quantum computing. So, and tensor network can explain quite a lot about Hamiltonians of systems and correlation to the data. So tight coupling between physics and a particular area of, uh, of uh, application of machine learning is, I, I think is very, very interesting. And here we, we can have uh, good results at some point. I have intuition. Thank you very much because it's a very interesting discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if, if you have any additional comment. In another case, thank you, Bertrand, for, for your presentation at the discussion. That was very, very interesting. Yeah. And you can... Thanks to you for the invitation and to everyone in the room, because I mean, your interest uh, as shown by, by the question is, uh, is huge and uh, it's very pleasant for me to have such an audience in front of me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. See you. Have a nice summer school. Hello, everyone, and sorry for the technical problems. I just wanted to welcome you to this presentation on the Destination Earth project. My name is Claudia Vitolo. I am a senior scientist for the European Space Agency Center for Earth Observation, where I work on digital twin um, Earth applications. Um, within the Destination Earth project, I'm leading the effort to establish partnerships and select use cases on this aside. Um, just a brief disclaimer, the Destination Earth project started very recently. So this is going to be a very brief and general description of the project. I will not go into much details as many decisions related to the design of the system are still under discussion, basically. If you could move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> next slide. OK, thank you. Um, my talk, uh, we touch upon a few main things. Um, I'm first going to present an overview of the project and its motivations. The, this will lead to dis a discussion about destination Earth components and target users, but I'm also going to briefly touch upon the role of the three entrusted entities, which are ECMWF, HumanSat, and ESA, and they will tell you more about that later. Then I will dive deeper on um, ESA's role and the activities I'm personally involved in. And lastly, I will briefly touch upon the timeline for the implementation of this very ambitious project. But now in terms of overview, um, can you move to... The next slide, please. <clears throat> Destination Earth, or Destiny in short, is an initiative of the European Commission under DigiConnect. The project is co-developed by three entrusted entities, the European Space Agency, or ESA, the ECMWF, which is the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, and UMETSAT which is the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites. The aim of this initiative is to develop on a global scale a highly accurate model of planet Earth. And um, this, is, this, this is called technically digital twin of the Earth. And a digital twin is different from any other traditional models in the sense that it is a live system that is constantly running, updating and adapting to mimic as best as possible the processes in the real world. And uh, this, um, this system is based on the best data models and infrastructure available at any given time. So the Destiny system will learn from past observation, for example, using Earth observations from satellites amongst many other types of data, to better understand and simulate the Earth system processes, for example, um, soil moisture or other um, processes, land surface processes, for example. 
It will use the current observations to monitor the present, but will also use numerical weather prediction models to predict the future changes, both in natural uh, phenomena as well as um, the, the interaction between the those natural phenomena with the human activities. And for instance, we will be able to do, to predict, for example, how floodplains and areas prone to wildfires are going to expand in the next decades. And as a consequence of this knowledge, we will be able to help countries plan where to best build infrastructures or where, where to expand urban areas, for example. We could help local authorities figure out how to best deal with water supply issues uh, based, for example, on predicted trends for drought indicators and maybe many more, many other things. <clears throat> but ultimately, Destination Earth, the observational modeling capabilities of Destination Earth will help advance science, especially with regard to climate change and natural disasters, and in particular to better to make better informed decisions and therefore adapt policies to climate related challenges. And this is very, very important because with the current model, it is still very difficult to make reliable predictions in the long term. But how can we achieve this in practically speaking? Um, maybe can you move to the next slide, please? So the only way we can make better predictions is to unlock the potential of digital modeling. And by this, I mean um, using the best modeling capabilities and Destiny promises global predictions made at one kilometer resolution, which is unheard of, unheard of. Um, but also the use of mo the most reliable data and technologies. So we also need to push the boundaries of computational efficiencies, um, for example, by employing HPCs, so high performance computing, but also machine learning. And I know you are very interested in the use of HPCs, and uh, I must admit, uh, HPCs in particular, GPU accelerated supercomputer is a key element for the destination Earth, for destination Earth to succeed. There are very critically, critical and computationally expensive parts of the Earth system model, which also ingest very large amount of data that can be accelerated using GPUs. And this is what we call the extreme, extreme scale computing. Um, but a lot of information also need to be extracted for specific application and this can also be done can only be done by machine learning so there is also a very heavy training aspect that, that would make use of hpc capabilities so the digital twin of the earth is expected to be highly computationally demanding and will build on um, European investment in high performance computing. In fact, um, Destiny has requested a dedicated allocation under Euro HPC. You might think, why a dedicated allocation? What is the computational cost associated to Destiny? Well, um, in the early stages of Destiny, it was estimated the need for 20,000 graphical processing units for an equivalent of about 20,000 megawatts of electricity. So this is uh, the equivalent electricity needed to power about 12,000 average homes in a year. So we need to make sure that Destiny solution does not become part of the problem, the global warming problem, right? So Destiny requested the, the use of a um, particular, the use of a particular supercomputer, which is called Lumi, and is uh, located in Finland. <clears throat> and this is considered to be the most carbon neutral source available. The, there is therefore an agreement between Destiny and EuroHPC that is definitely gonna 
uh, going to benefit Destiny, but it's also going to benefit Euro HPC because many countries in Europe have made a significant investment in this um, initiative, in the Euro HPC initiative, and protecting our societies from natural hazards and having tools for an effective adapt adaptation to climate change would certainly be, certainly be an excellent proof that the investment has been worked worth doing. So um, we can maybe move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so Destination Earth will help both scientists and policymakers, at least in phase one, in three different ways. We'll provide a reliable, reliable simulations and predictions, which will allow to build actionable solutions for societies to adapt to climate change, but will also help understand how the complex interaction between the um, environment and human work so that the future policies can be, can be based um, on better evidence. And we'll also promote innovation. In fact, industry will be able to build on destiny data and services uh, to develop applications in support of the green transition, for example, helping the Europe reach its global its goal of uh, becoming carbon neutral by 2050. Next slide, please. So let, let me tell you about what the components are of Destiny, and um, then I will touch upon the users as well. Destiny will attract a wide pool of potential users, and these users will interact with the system via the so-called open core platform, or we currently have changed slightly the name, now we call it uh, Destiny Core Service Platform, or DESP, D-E-S-P. And DESP is going to be developed by ESA. Users are expected to be onboarded and registered through the platform, and the platform will provide access to data application and services. So the digital twin of the Earth, the ultimate goal of this project, will work by connecting together information from, digi from several thematic digital twins. And in phase one, in the first two years and a half of the project, we will be focusing on two particular uh, digital twins. One will look at, will predict extreme natural disasters. And the second one will look at climate change adaptations. Um, the computational engine, which is called DTE, the Digital Twin Engine, that will generate the output from the different thematic digital twins will be develop, developed by ECMWF. Um, while UMETSAT will provide the Destination Earth Data Lake, which is uh, uh, basically a data infrastructure that will serve outputs from the digital twins, but also from external uh, resources, for example, frequently used data sets, etc. Um, it is important to highlight that the core service platform or DESP will allow links also with external services. So we are not going to reinvent the wheel and uh, re re-implement a different data access for Copernicus services, for example. The Copernicus services will be linked to Destination Earth. So we will make, we will have interfaces with uh, services external to Destination Earth in order to um, avoid reinventing the wheel. But we'll, the, the platform will also give the possibility for users to run models, uh, for example, artificial intelligence models, and share their own data sets through um, a shared space, which is called the user space within this team. And all is hosted on the cloud. <clears throat> but uh, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, what the users are, are and how, 
how they are going to benefit from Destination Earth, at least um, in the first phase of the project. The next slide, please. So, as I mentioned before, the Destination Earth project will be of interest to many categories of users. However, for an efficient implementation of the project, some of the user groups have been given a higher priority than others. For example, in phase one, which ends in June 2024, uh, the focus will be on policy and decision makers, while in parallel we have work um, ongoing jointly with the amongst the three um, interested entities for a progressive engagement of other user groups. But the onboarding of these new, new user groups will only start in phase two. Destination Earth is making three very explicit commitments to help policymakers. The one, the first one is that it, it, it promises to monitor and simulate Earth systems and human interventions in the um, um, not only land and marine, but also atmosphere and biosphere. Um, it promises to anticipate environmental disasters and the resultant socioeconomic crisis to save life and avoid large economic downturns, but also um, it promises to enable the development and testing of scenarios for sustainable development. Next slide, please. Um, now that you have a general idea of what uh, Destination Earth is and what the different entities do, I'm going to now focus a little bit more on what the role of ESA is within this uh, big project. ESA is, um, has two main tasks. The first one is to procure, manage, and manage the contract for operation, service, provision, and long-term sustainability, uh, sustainability and evolutive uh, maintenance of the Destination Earth Core Service Platform from a service provider. Then the service pro provider, in turn, will provide, will uh, operate and perform the maintenance of the core service platform, will manage and provide access to all different services, resources, and capabilities, and will also interface with users. The second task um, is to establish partnerships and select use cases for, de for demonstrating Destination Earth capabilities. And in previous meetings, I get always the question, what is really the difference between having a partnership and developing a use case? And the difference is that um, establish, establishing an, a partnership means uh, having a, an in-kind agreement. So there is no exchange of funds between ESA or any other um, interested entity and the policy end user, because the policy end user will ultimately benefit from the, the platform and in exchange will provide usable, useful feedback to the destination, destination Earth developers in order to plan long-term um, updates and uh, um, design um, future capabilities of the system, et cetera. Direct, based on, on direct user requirements. While use cases are instead some procured activities. So we have a budget and we will fund the development of a number of use cases that can prove, first of all, the value, the, the, fun, the, the ease of use of the, the platform itself, but also the added value of Destination Earth as a system compared to what is existing already out there, and also what, uh, to prove the, um, the value of uh, the data and information that is provided within Destination Earth. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Destination the uh, Destiny platform has a number of goals. Um, the first one is to support the exploitation of Destiny data. And if you think about that, this is novel data. Therefore, 
is not available anywhere else. And so this is really the portal where the users will, uh, will be able to find this novel data, explore it, um, do data managing, modeling, etc. Uh, the, the platform, in fact, will support development, integration, and operation of complementary services for end users on the platform. And these are called third party applications. And users, for example, will not re are not really expected to um, register, download the data, and process it uh, separately because we are talking about very, very large volume of data. And so, <clears throat> Um, there are analytical tools built in in the platform that will allow data managing and modeling directly in the cloud. Um, we'll also allow users uh, and service autonomy, but at the same time, we'll support open collaboration between destination Earth platform users. In fact, there is, there is going to be a lot of emphasis on open science uh, principles and uh, um, various types of educational material will be available later on uh, in phase one. Um, the interaction, though, um, the, the interaction of users with the platform will depend very much on the goals and abilities of the users. We expect a first set of services to be available in 2023, but um, the maximum quality of the services is only expected uh, in uh, the, towards the end of phase one, so towards uh, the uh, around the beginning of 2024. Next slide, please. So, um, the Destiny Core Service Platform. Uh, this is just a summary of what I've uh, just said before. So, the Destiny Core Service Platform is expected to be the place to explore and analyze Destiny data to develop and run models, simulations, and based on destiny, destiny data, but also based you know, on a, a complex um, combination of uh, user-generated data with destination data, for example. It's also the place to build, deploy, and operate new services and to publish, share, and share results of application and services. <coughs> Next slide, please. Now let's explore very briefly what the destination Earth interaction model is. So in other terms, what is the relationship between the user and the destination Earth platform? Next slide, please. So um, the users can either be service providers or service consumers. But in reality, they can also be a combination of those two. So I give you a very simple example. Users can, be, can register to just download the data, right? And they, uh, they act in this way as service consumers. But they can also, and at the same time, integrate their own data and services to generate new information within one workflow that sits just um, or entirely within the destination Earth environment. And it's in this case, they will act as service providers. So um, next, next slide, please. So um, the, let's see how to make sure that users uh, will benefit from destination Earth. Destination Earth is very ambitious. It's a very ambitious project and the platform as well, the goal of the platform are also very, very ambitious. The, the platform is um, planned for a large user community uh, with a gradual onboarding of different user groups. And this comes from ESA experience uh, dealing with Copernicus data services, for example. Um, where ESA is used to deal with communities of half a million users, for example, and there is a lot of lesson learned that can really be used within Destination Earth. But there is also a joint work going on amongst ESA, CMWF, UMESAT, but also DigiConnect 
to design a strategy for community building long term and to engage in, and for the engagement of several user groups well beyond uh, phase one. The platform is also designed to be inclusive and this is strictly related to the first point because in the long term, many user groups are expected to be onboarded and each user group has different expectations. Workflows are based on different tools. And so the platform will try to accommodate this quite flexibly by providing different visualization tools that are useful for experts as well as non-experts, but also analytical tools built in the, the platform that will allow workflows to be coded, for example, in different programming languages, for example. And last but not least, DASP is developed and operate and implementing EU regulations and will benefit from DigiConnect work on the design and implementation of the overarching cloud and the DSPs federation. So in short, we can say the DESP model has to be attractive and competitive for a very, very large variety of users. And this is really ambitious. So <clears throat> next slide, please. As I mentioned before, um, Destination Earth will provide uh, um, infrastructure as a service basically to enable the deployment of user workflows, right? But projects that already have already an established infrastructure and workflows will have to work a little bit to test Destination Earth data and services prior to onboarding because there can, because they, the resources are going to be limited and uh, um, the demand can easily exceed the, available, the availability of resources. And so there are uh, some challenges uh, already envisaged from the service perspective. For example, because we have a limited shared um, data and compute resources, so this could affect, for example, access to the CINI high volume data or um, the computational side, for example, if users need to extract, compress, or model the data. In terms of management, destiny service uh, provision would be based on a fixed global allocation and user quotas, and this means that the performance may depend on the user profile, operation profile. So uh, next slide, please. These are just few um, um, take home messages basically. Destination Earth is not, a, cannot be envisaged as a monolithic platform. We we'll have to support many forms of interactions to consume resources. Um, DESP is designed to, with scalability and also inclusivity in mind. And services are not conceived for a reduced set of users, but we, we really have. Uh, uh, the expectation of being able to onboard and work with uh, a large um, pool of uh, user groups. This will also support the development of large variety of services based on standard interfaces and resources management approach. And last but not least, third party services can be autonomously deployed and operated between them uh, based on um, DESP APIs, the core service platform, and uh, destination Earth capabilities for uh, the digital twin engine, the digital twins, the thematic ones, uh, the product generation, and um, data lake operations. Last slide, please. And I would like to close my talk by giving you a um, an idea of the timeline. Destination Earth will be developed gradually um, until 2030, and we we'll follow these three key milestones. By 2024, uh, the development of the core open core digital platform, the core service platform, and the two digital twins developed by ECM and WF will be fully operational. By 2027, there will be the integration of additional digital twins that will serve sector-specific use cases into the platform. And only in 2030, we expect 
to have a full digital replica of the Earth, so the, the so-called digital twin of the Earth, which is basically a convergence of all the digital, the thematic digital twins that will be already available on the platform. And uh, last slide, please. This is just to say thank you to, for listening to my talk and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah. So right now, uh, I'll actually um, bring this up shortly. So this is um, this is a you all are logging into a Jupiter Hub that I set up. Um, and if you're having issues, definitely do um, let me know, uh, and I can try and debug it. Um, but here's the um, the link. You go here, and this is a, a oops, sorry, a Jupyter Hub deployment. Uh, pick out a user name, just something uh, unique that nobody else is going to pick, um, and then uh, the password uh, when it prompts you for that is HDCRS. Um, and this will get you logged into a um, Jupyter Hub a server that's running in Azure in the cloud um, next to the data that we'll be working with. Um, so I'll let this uh, spin up and I can uh, take a look at, uh, hopefully some people, yeah, it looks like some people are uh, having success, hopefully. Um, here's mine, I'll try not to show anyone's uh, pod names just in case uh, there's an email or something in there. But um, yeah, so here's my my Jupyter notebook server. So I logged in and there's some stuff in the background that we'll talk about um, running on Azure Kubernetes service that's kind of spinning up uh, Jupyter notebook servers for you um, and then downloading the uh, materials for today. All right, so we'll wait for that. Just about a uh, couple of minutes. Hopefully the startup should be pretty quick for you all since I got the um, I got some notes scaled up ahead of time uh, and depending on exactly how many people there are uh, some of you all might have to wait on an auto scaling node pool to bring up new VMs if necessary but hopefully we have enough uh, ready to go okay great Someone actually did. I was going to check. Someone picked the username, uh, something unique. Uh, so uh, kudos to you. I'll just show that here. Uh, so the literal username, something unique. Uh, I was wondering if anyone would do that. Hopefully not. Uh, two people didn't do it. Uh, it's not going to be a huge problem. Uh, well, it, it will be a problem for you too uh, if two people did that. So. Uh, well done, well done, cool. Um, just to, uh, as we're spinning things up, we'll kind of get into the um, get into the first notebook. Um, so we're going to be using uh, Jupyter Lab is kind of the UI that you see right now, or should be coming up for you shortly. Um, and then we'll be using uh, Python for the most part, or exclusively. But uh, most of the concepts uh, that we're talking are. About today, things like stack and cloud native geospatial apply equally well to um, any any language, really. Um, and Jupyter supports tons and tons of languages. So um, stuff I want, I want things, you know, we're going to have some fairly specific examples, but I want it to be generalizable as much as possible. Um, over on the left here, we have this uh, file browser uh, pane. Um, so you can go ahead and open up the first notebook here, which is this 01. Uh, reading stack. Here's the URL one more time, just in case people need that. And then this will go away in just a sec, and I will be moving on to the first notebook. All right. Let's jump into it. And again, if you're having any uh, issues, put them in the YouTube chat or uh, uh, just holler out in the room and uh, hopefully get it fixed for you. Okay, cool. Um, so first thing, um, I did kind of skip over the things we'll be talking about today. So uh, we're gonna be talking about stack, spatial temporal asset catalog. Uh, we'll talk a bit about parallel and distributed computing um, and then a bit about cloud native geospatial. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll depending on time, uh, we'll go into some kind of specific examples, um, uh, kind of applying these concepts. 
But first of all, reading stack. Um, so planetary computer, uh, just to kind of you know show what that is, uh, not gonna talk about it too much. Uh, we'll mostly just be using it, uh, but at a high level planetary computer, it's, it's a whole bunch of data, um, geospatial data in Azure that's there waiting for you to use it. Um, all that data is hosted in Azure Blob Storage, has great scalability, um, performance, things like that. Um, but the files in Blob Storage alone are kind of hard to use. So we provide various APIs to make using that data easier. And then the, the last you know, main component is the, uh, the compute. So Azure has tons and tons of different ways to do compute from like, you know, uh, MPI enabled HPC nodes to uh, all sorts of various VMs. Uh, we happen to be using Azure Kubernetes service on a Jupyter Hub deployment, but there are many, many different ways to do compute. The only important thing is that the compute is next to data. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, but that's that's basically the uh, the planetary computer in a nutshell is data APIs and compute. Okay, um, I want to just like uh, we're going to talk about some kind of uh, uh, less interesting, let's say, uh, details around like metadata standards, which maybe uh, that's your your sort of thing. Maybe you enjoy that stuff. Uh, but just in case uh, to kind of like motivate it, let's say you have uh, some task where where you want to say. Um, you know, analyze all the Sentinel-2 level 2 imagery, uh, level 2A imagery over uh, Redmond, Washington for 2021. Um, and with Stack, you know, that's going to be you know, a dozen or so lines of code. It's going to finish in five or so seconds. We're able to, to use the planetary computer's Stack API uh, to query the Sentinel-2 level 2A collection for this bounding box over Redmond, Washington. For this date range for 2021, we can even throw in things like uh, only give me the scenes that have been labeled as having less than 20% cloud cover. Okay, and with higher level libraries like Stack Stack, we're able to quickly uh, take that whatever that result is, which we'll go into detail in a second. But we're able to take that result and uh, basically form this data cube, you know, high level data cube, uh, out of those uh, stack items. Okay, and at this point, like our analysis is is ready to start. So you know, a dozen lines of code from you know question to your your data uh, that you need to to start your analysis. So that's kind of like the the main value proposition of Stack is is enabling access to these large geospatial data sets. So let's uh, go into like the um, details of how of how that works, um, and maybe even just like pause to reflect about. You know, what is what, what would that look like if you didn't have stack? So what if you just had files on some file system? Um, in this case, the files happen to be hosted in Azure blob storage. So we'll use this, um, this uh, library called ADLFS, which gives file system like os.path like uh, APIs for working with uh, arbitrary file systems. And, you know, if we, we list this out, there's like some long path. Uh, with like lots of strings that, uh, you know, substrings that I don't really understand. Um, what did I do wrong there? I think I copy pasted. Oh, I forgot the dot safe. Yeah, so if I like go into this directory, you know, there's things like the granule and it's just like, you know, the super long path, uh, still still nested, lots and lots of, of subdirectories in here that like somehow somewhere in here, there's some, uh, files probably under this image data uh, directory. So it's just like super, super nested. It's not immediately clear like what all of these, like this is probably a date or yeah, it's probably some sort of date time. There's another date time here. They're different. What's the difference? So it's, anyway, it's, it's like quite hard to go from just files and blob storage to like your, your data structure that you want to work with. Um, so that's like one of the, the main Value uh, values that uh, Stack provides is this the standardized way to take arbitrary, you know, assets, uh, geospatial assets that are on some file system, uh, and catalog them with a consistent um, consistent schema. Okay, um, let's go into Stack. And again, if there are any questions, um, oh yeah, thank you for posting that in the in the chat. Um, 
and yeah, if you if you are having issues, uh, let me know in the chat what uh, exactly is is going wrong, uh, and I can try and help you out. Um, I'll put the link in there one more time. And I'm also going to check the logs to see if there's anyone. So it doesn't look like there's any uh, pods that are pending or like halfway started. So um, yeah, so let me know exactly what your area is, if it's like the yeah username or password or something like that. Uh, or if you're getting like a, a long error message, if you're able to post that uh, in the chat, I can try and help you out. Okay. And let me bring that back up. Great. Um, yeah, so let's uh, actually dive into uh, into Stack. Uh, you know what what actually is it? So Stack is the spatiotemporal asset catalog, and it's all about um, cataloging metadata for geospatial assets. Um, so just some some you know simple examples are things like the spatial and temporal coverage extent of a Sentinel two scene. That would be like the metadata that we're capturing for these uh, the assets, the actual like uh, TIFF files that make up the Sentinel-2 scene. The main uh, item, the main building block of Stack is the Stack item. Um, that's actually a GeoJSON feature, so it's compatible with that API and everything that builds off of it. Um, we'll just take a, a look at this first item, and you can see, you know, it's it's a GeoJSON feature. We can uh, this is a Pi stack item. We convert it to a, a JSON object, a dictionary, and we can you know do things that any any GeoJSON uh, thing will work with it. So this IPy IPython that display only knows about GeoJSON. It doesn't know about stack, but that's okay. Um, but there's also a whole bunch of other additional features in addition to the kind of core things that are required by, um, by GeoJSON. Um, so stack adds on things, this comes from GeoJSON, the, you know, the geometry, it's polygon, comes from GeoJSON, but there's also things like the ID and the stack version, um, and then a whole bunch of additional um, metadata that can go under the properties. Um, some things are, are part of like the core stack specification itself. So these are things like the um, date time and then the optional kind of platform, uh, like the satellite, I think that the, um, the actual sensor instrument is on. Um, other things, the so stack is also very extensible. So there's things to record domain specific um, attributes. So things like the uh, EPSG code that the uh, projected data are in. Um, things like uh, data set specific things, like whatever this NGRS uh, tile thing is from the Sentinel-2 um, uh, extension. So lots and lots of metadata here, um, but again, no, no data. Um, the data are actually linked to under the assets. Um, so each of these is a, um, you know, a, a value, uh, sorry, a URL in, to a file in, in this case, Azure Blob Storage, uh, plus some additional metadata like the media type, um, you know, description, uh, the title, uh, and then asset specific things like the bounding box of this specific asset, which might differ from the bounding box of some of the other assets in the item. Okay. Uh, the EO bands is a place to put things like the you know uh, wavelength of the sensor that captured the uh, image, things like that. Okay, I'm gonna close this. Those are assets. Um, we talked through uh, that one already, and then uh, going up a level. So we have the item kind of in the middle uh, that holds on to has many children assets. Uh, going up a level, we have the stack collection. So collection, stack collection is a collection of stack items, um, plus a bit of additional metadata. Uh, so things like an ID, a description, uh, you can provide things like keywords um, that can assist in things like search, um, things like summaries, if you want to get like a, a high level overview of, of what is, you know, the very values that some of these item level things can take on. So uh, some of the items are 10, 20, 60 uh, meter GSD. Okay. And then finally, above collections, uh, which is really, we have a stack catalog, uh, which is like a collection of collections. 
Okay, so there's a stack catalog. We would say like the planetary computers um, API stack v1 slash collection. So these are all of the collections that are available through the planetary computer uh, stack API. Okay. If you want, you can uh, browse through the uh, data catalog here. I'll put it in the chat. That's just that uh, slash catalog. Okay, that is the core stack specification. So it's basically saying stack says, you know, defines how these uh, JSON objects should look like. What are the required fields? What are the optional ones? How do you declare extensions? Things like that. Um, uh, in addition, or on top of that core specification, there's the API uh, specification, the stack API specification which defines uh, like REST APIs that clients and servers can use to interact. Um, so if you click the link here, you'll get the docs page for our uh, stack API, which is implementing this 1.0.0 RC1. Um, and, and it has things like the search API. So you can see all the parameters that go into the search API, the search endpoint. Okay, so brief summary stack, it's a standard for metadata. Okay, so it's not strictly about data, actual like imagery, it's about cataloging those uh, assets. Uh, it has a few different levels. There's the highest level kind of catalog, which is a grouping of collections or even other catalogs. There's the collection, which group together uh, related items. So typically you have like one collection per uh, high level data sets, like Sentinel 2, level 2A, uh, Landsat, collection 2, level 2, things like that. You have a stack item which is a GeoJSON feature plus a whole bunch of additional metadata. And then assets, which are the actual links to the files themselves. And building on top of that, there's the stack API. It's how clients and servers kind of communicate. Okay. So we already saw it, but just to kind of reiterate, now that we know a bit more about stack, let's, um, let's use that search API again. Um, I should mention, so we're using PyStack client. There's also an R stack library if you're using the R uh, programming language. Um, you can make you know, raw HTTP requests. Uh, it doesn't, yeah, lots of, lots of client libraries or you can just use HTTP directly. Um, we're gonna use PyStack client. Uh, and in this case, we'll search for Landsat uh, collection two level two uh, over that same bounding box and this time for 2020. And we get eight um, matching items. Uh, we provide a bounding box uh, as a bounding box. You can also uh, post a, an area of interest in the body as a, a GeoJSON uh, uh, object. That returns in a PyStack item collection. So you can do things kind of like a list of items, roughly. We have eight items in this item collection. Um, they are, you know, all about metadata, but you can kind of treat them like data if you want. So, you know, you can do things like load the stack items into a uh, GeoPandas uh, geo data frame. Uh, even do things like um, uh, explore the values there. It's not going to be super interesting uh, just because they're all you know overlapping and things like that. But you can see the footprints of the uh, of the various uh, records here, the items. Close that out. It's using uh, dot explore. In this case, Landsat uh, C2L2 implements the cloud cover uh, extension. So we can do things like select the least cloudy item by taking the minimum uh, over these items and grabbing the cloud cover, which is the percent cloudy. Landsat has you know, a whole bunch of items on it uh, from you know, QA bands, uh, the actual kind of data bands themselves. Um, uh, metadata files like the XML, MTL, X uh, metadata file. Um, and then a couple of uh, additional ones that we um, add from the planetary computer. So as you mentioned, so like for Landsat, collection two, level two, uh, USGS is the, um, you know, the provider there. They're the ones that actually, uh, uh, you know, run that mission, generate that data. Um, and they're providing cloud optimized geotists. They're also actually providing uh, stack items. So we're, you know, uh, rehosting the data in Azure if you want to access it from Azure rather than from uh, USGS's server. 
Um, and then we're just hosting those assets, those exact same assets copied over from Azure. And then we're uh, using these same stack items and building on them actually, because um, we also have this um, data API. So if you look at the rendered preview, um, you'll notice that it, it's not pointing to Azure blob storage. Those have URLs like .blob.core.windows.net. Um, this one's in our data API. Um, and it has you know, some other stuff here. So we'll talk a bit about this uh, in the third notebook, but for now, this is just an easy way to get like this rendered preview of the raw data. Um, and it's actually generated on the fly from the uh, cloud optimized geotiffs itself. So um, quick way to get the rendered preview uh, kind of dynamically from the items. Okay. If you want the actual URL itself, uh, uh, sorry, the URL to an, a, an actual item in blob storage, you see that dot blob dot core dot windows dot net thing. Um, we go ahead and make a, an HTTP request to get that. And you see that we get a 404. So we, you know, we're not allowed to, to access the data um, until we sign the item. Okay, so this is how we do like our, basically our egress management, keep an eye on things, make sure that, um, you know, uh, rate limiting and egress is under control. Um, and so all of you are accessing, I'm accessing the, the data uh, completely anonymously, um, don't have to have a planetary computer account to access and use the data. Um, you do need, if you want, um, to have like higher uh, rate limits, you can sign up for a planetary computer account and I'll talk about it, that at the end. But uh, for now, we're just gonna access the data completely anonymously. Uh, there's a data authentication API. If you wanna do this kind of manually, you give it like the URL, the file that you're trying to, to download as a query parameter and get back the signed token. Um, or we can just use the planetary computer uh, package and it'll do it for us. <clears throat> okay. So now we have a signed URL. It's basically the same URL with a little uh, token appended to the end. You can print it out if you want. Um, and this lets us actually access the data. So in this case, we'll use Rio X array. We'll open up the file and make a, uh, a less pretty picture of the uh, blue band here. So Rio X arrays a you know builds on Raster Rio, so it's just a, a nice way to open up a single um, cloud optimized geotiff, or it, it handles other things too. Um, but if you're working with a, a whole bunch of stack items, it's often uh, convenient to use a library like Stack Stack or ODC Stack to uh, kind of build the data cube for you. Um, this is returning an X-ray data array, which is like a, a NumPy array, an n-dimensional array, except X-ray adds on top uh, named dimensions. So we have things like time, band, Y, and X, rather than like 0, 1, 2, 3. We also have uh, labels. Um, I'll expand the coordinates for like band here. You can see the bands are QA red. So we're able to like select a specific band by coordinate label rather than just by position, having to know that, you know, QA is first, red is like third or fourth or something like that. <clears throat> okay. Um, the stack API kind of specification says, you know, what, what do you do if you have a query, a bounding box or an, um, an intersects that is um, just overlaps, partially overlaps with a, an asset, an, sorry, a stack item. Um, so they say that if, if they overlap at all, then you return it in the result set. Um, so we can, you know, crop down uh, the uh, data cube, the output data cube, uh, just to what we asked for with the bounds lat long keyword. Provide that B box there, and then we get our smaller, uh, smaller data right here. Um, very briefly, uh, you'll use this in the exercise shortly, but very briefly, um, X-ray, uh, like I mentioned, it lets you do a lot of stuff by names that you would have to do by um, position with NumPy. Uh, so you can do things like select the red band uh, by name rather than something, um, it'd be something like, like this. Um, and then, you know, whatever red is, I, I think it's like three, you know, something like this. If, you, if you're just using, you know, NumPy um, and you have to make sure that this is actually red and not something else. So you can select uh, bands by by name, and you can also select by 
um, position with the I cell method. Pass in the name of the dimension that you want to index along, and then the uh, position in this case. Okay, right, so we're going to do our first uh, exercise here, computing NDVI uh, over uh, Reykjavik. Uh, and uh, formulas here. Um, going to go ahead and uh, use the um, uh, prompts that I've provided here. So there are some ellipses that you can fill in with the relevant bits. We're going to be using Landsat uh, Collection 2 Level 2. Uh, you might want to go to this page, the, the data set detail page. Um, that'll have all the information about like, uh, you know, what is the name of the red band? Uh, that's the name. And then maybe like the stack key might be useful. Uh, likewise for the near infrared. So there's lots of uh, extra information here about the data set on this detail page that comes from the stack, the collection metadata actually. So go ahead and do the search, uh, build your data queue, grab out your bands and compute NDVI and then uh, plot it for a single uh, time period here. Okay, we'll give that about uh, four or five minutes or so. And then we'll go through the solution together. The solutions under this, um, if you wanna check your work, you can click on these three dots here in the next cell and that'll expand a suggested solution. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. All right, we'll start um, working our way through it through this. If you're still finishing up, that's totally fine. Um, the uh, first thing we need here is the collection name. Um, that's you know available here. It's available in the URL up here. Um, so this is the kind of key in that big collections uh, list. Um, so that's our collections for Landsat collection two level two. Our bounding box. We're going to provide that and then our uh, date time or our time range there. Uh, so we kick off that query. We get a name error. I probably had a typo. Uh, time, date time, uh, time range. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 45 items matched our query. Okay. We're going to go ahead and um, uh, load those in. In this case, the two assets that we want uh, referring here to our um, table of item assets is our uh, red and our, I think it's NIR08 is gonna give us the near infrared band. So red and NIR08, red NIR08. Um, I had a dot, dot, dot here. Uh, you can do things like EO, uh, or no, what was I? I can't remember what I was leading this for. for. We'll see if we get an error. Oh yes, uh, I was gonna do the bounds lat lawn uh, equal to uh, B box. So we crop it down to just the area of interest. If you didn't do that, um, hopefully, uh, hopefully it didn't uh, kill your notebook session because you ran out of memory. Uh, it was a little bit of a dangerous prompt to leave there. So uh, bounds lat long, uh, get a little bit smaller of, of an item here. Um, there was a question in the chat, uh, instead of working on single tiles, can we resample and merge tiles together prior to analysis of the data sets? And, and yeah, so if you look, um, how big is our bounding box? So if you have a bounding box that crosses um, crosses items, which I think this one does, uh, like uh, zones, areas that the satellite's capturing them. If this uh, library is like stack, stack, row, DC, stack, do kind of uh, mosaic them together. Uh, so you, you get this larger um, data cube that's larger than any single uh, kind of tile. And it's, it's handling all the stuff of like making sure that they're in the, you know, grid aligned, uh, resampled uh, CRS and, and things like that. Okay. Uh, so we will select the uh, band equal to red for the red and the uh, band equal to NAR08 for NAR08. Uh, then we'll compute NDVI, which I think is, is it NIR minus red? Correct me if this is wrong. Uh, plus red, I think that's right. And this gives us uh, back this um, this data array that has uh, 45 you know items along the time. So our 45 uh, uh, temporal slices 
and then our y and our x we've collapsed over the band dimension and if we want to make a plot for just the first one we'll select the time equals zero uh, and plot that okay and uh, it's not the not the prettiest picture in the world uh there are probably other areas uh where we can get nicer looking than dvis but this is uh appropriate i thought okay if there are any questions, put them in the in the chat or ask them out. Uh, pause for a sec before we move on. All right, um, we've already seen this. I'm going to go through it very briefly. But um, some stack APIs, like the planetary computers, uh, support additional you know querying on additional uh, fields, not just the uh, like the uh, bounding box and time date time. Uh, so you can provide these queries, uh, and there's also an, an additional. Uh, like custom CQL to query language just for stack that's being built up. Um, this is a little bit simpler. We're able to do things like give me where, uh, items where the cloud cover is less than 20. Um, it's also helpful for data sets like uh, Goes, which is kind of always capturing in these uh, multiple modes. Uh, or yeah, these they're in the it's in these modes that's uh, bringing down different. Um, kinds of items so it's collecting like a full disk scene uh three observations of the continental united states and 30 observations of some zoomed in meso scale every 30 minutes or 15 minutes so like these all kind of get mixed in if you want to select just the meso scale images you can uh use the query extension to uh to do that okay uh, we'll go through this again pretty quick just for time but it's worth noting that you can also work with like stack catalogs and do things like analyze the summaries, uh, either to just you know understand it or presentation or you know doing whatever. So we can look at the summaries for the O bands um, uh, values that will be on the items. Uh, you can also uh, yeah list all the assets. We've already looked at this. Uh, and finally, it's worth mentioning that some you can also have assets off of collections. Um, this can be useful for data sets where it might not make sense to have like individual stack items instead you just uh, have something on the collection in this case we're working with the daymat daily uh data over hawaii we have a link to this uh czar store in azure blob storage which we can load up uh again this is coming directly off of the catalog we have all these data variables and an x-ray data set and we can do something like plot the T max uh, maximum temperature at a specific point. Okay. Let's uh, move on. If there are questions, ask them and I'll uh, circle back to them. But just in the interest of time, let's uh, keep moving on. Uh, there's a question, uh, how many images could be loaded into memory at the same time? Uh, the primary limitation there is uh, gonna be around the memory. Um, so, you know, whatever, in this case, we have, I think, eight gigs, roughly, on the this uh, Jupyter notebook. If you look down at the very bottom, you can see that uh, memory usage. Um, that's going to be the main limiting factor, although we'll talk about in Dask uh, shortly uh, how you can do things like um, uh, parallel distributed out-of-core processing. So you can process data sets that are much larger than fit in memory on a single machine. Um, there was a question uh, about doing things like time series processing. Uh, I have a, an example started, but not yet finished uh, for time series type stuff on satellite imagery. So uh, hopefully have something next week. Um, there is, um, I'm gonna go to our examples here. Um, there are some examples, uh, definitely with uh, something like uh, czar data, uh, where the the time series are kind of like built into the data structure. Um, this is using daymet, I think, which we just saw. Yeah, so you can do things like plot the. Um, oh, I don't know if I I do it in this example. Anyway, uh, daymet, you know, we have a time series here already, and you can start to do stuff from there. Um, so just to say, you know, it is possible. Uh, these data cubes that we're forming do have time as one of the dimensions. And then, you know, as far as like exactly what you want to do, like taking averages over space, um, but not over time, you know, that's totally possible. Fancier things. Um, I, you would have to tell me how you do that. Um, pixel quality flags, uh, things like MODIS. Um, 
Yeah, so we're just, um, you know, loading up these these data cubes. Uh, so if you want to work with pixel quality flags, you can include that as uh, like one of the bands that you load. I don't think um, we have any um, examples of that directly in the planetary computer, but the, um, the well, let's see, one of these uh, examples from the stack stack, which I'll put in the chat um, here, uh, QA definitely does uh, work with cloudy pixels. I think it's this one. I'll put this in the chat and you can take a look at that. Um, yeah, so there's nothing like built into necessarily to like X-ray or stack stack um, for things like uh, expanding the bits uh, on a on a QA pixel, things like that, uh, or masking with a, a pixel uh, uh, bits flags. Um, ODC stack might have some of those kind of higher level things. Uh, but for in this example, I think uh, it's just kind of doing all that uh, bit manipulation manually. And then a uh, question about uh, selecting a polygon. Do we get the um, data in the pixel? I'm not quite sure. Um, but if you um, if you look at uh, like this um, data set here, let's say like uh, you know, red, we selected out that. So if we look at like zero, 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 this is going to be, you know, the pixel value at that exact uh, pixel. Hopefully that answers your question. And if you're asking like, how do I do things like uh, index by a polygon? Um, I think Rio X-Ray has a, a crop method uh, or what do they call it? Clip box. Uh, so I think clip will let you clip by some arbitrary geometry. So if that was your question, hopefully that helps you out. Okay. We will, I think, get started on this notebook. Uh, I might keep you from your coffee for just a, a couple of minutes, depending on time. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about parallel uh, computing, parallelizing code with Dask. Um, specifically using Dask Delayed as kind of an introduction to Dask. Okay, um, so first of all, we're gonna make this uh, client here and we'll, we'll talk uh, a bit more about that later, but this is making a, a local cluster in air quotes. So we have uh, a few processes that it started up and it's kind of like a, a distributed cluster. Um, I'm gonna open up the, you can either click this link and kind of this will open up the Dask dashboard which will be helpful to see what's going on. I'm gonna um, copy out the uh, proxy component. And if you click on the Dask uh, icon here and paste that slash proxy slash, it should be 8787 slash status. I'm gonna build my own little dashboard here with the uh, progress and the task stream. And then I'm gonna lay that out uh, like so. So again, I took the um, slash proxy slash eight seven eight seven slash status, clicked on the DAS icon and pasted that here, and then I grabbed out the task stream and the progress um, dashboard panes, or you can just click that link. Okay, um, so we're gonna go through some exercises here, um, kind of uh, parallelizing some code. Uh, very brief introduction though. We're gonna be using DAS delayed on these kind of toy functions. One function just uh, increments a number. So it takes a number, adds one to it. Uh, another function takes two numbers, adds them together. And we have this uh, time.sleep in here just to kind of simulate doing real work. So if we run this, you know, increment on one, increment on uh, two, and then add those two outputs together, as expected, it takes about three seconds to run. If you look at this, you'll notice that maybe those two increments can be called in, in parallel. And we'll go ahead and use DAS delayed to accomplish it. So delayed, it's a, it's a decorator. It's a function that takes the function, returns another function. So the way you use it is you wrap your, your Python functions and then just call things normally. Okay, so we'll call this delayed increment with one. We'll call it delayed increment with two and then we'll call a delayed add with the outputs of those first two steps. 
Uh, you can see this ran in like a millisecond. Uh, so this Z thing, you know, clearly this should at a minimum take one second, right? That's how much time one of these takes to run. So there's no possible way it could be done with the actual result um, that quickly. And what happened is um, Dask is, is instead of uh, building, uh, instead of computing immediately, it's building up this kind of task graph. Uh, if we call compute, then we'll actually see things kind of kick off. Okay, so it's less than three seconds now. If you look at your dashboard, you'll see that some things did happen in parallel. So these two increments, it looks like they happened at the same time on different threads or processes. And then our add ran, <clears throat> our add function ran after that. So this Z object, it's not our answer of uh, five or whatever it is. It's this delayed, add thing, so here's our function name, and then this other stuff, whatever that is. Uh, we can visualize the task graph and kind of see what's you know happened behind the scenes here is um, with DAS delayed, instead of executing immediately, it's kind of building up this task graph of things to do when the user requests the output. So in this case, we do the build up this task graph and then we call compute to get the output couple of things just to like think about as we're going through the rest of the notebook, we'll skip over these, but things like how come the time went from three seconds to two seconds instead of all the way down to one, okay? Or how come it went from three seconds to a little bit over two seconds? Okay, it was like 2.15 seconds. It wasn't exactly two seconds. So what's going on there? Uh, what would happen if we had really fast executing functions? Would, would Dash still speed it up or would it actually be slower. So some things to think about. Um, we'll, we'll do this exercise first, I think, um, before the break. Um, we're going to have this list of numbers here. We're going to iterate over them, uh, incrementing each one, collecting the results in this list, and then taking the total. Um, so see if you can go ahead and, and uh, work on this, this exercise. Uh, it takes about, um, about eight seconds for the non-parallelized version. See if you can uh, speed that up using DAS delayed. It's going to involve uh, wrapping a couple of uh, places with, uh, with, with the delayed function. Take a minute or so on that. OK, hopefully you've had a chance to uh, work on that a bit. So in this case, there are two places where we want to add delayed. The first one's on this uh, increment. So this is the, uh, the serial code. From up above, we'll wrap increment uh, in delayed again. We'll also wrap um, uh, sum in delayed. Uh, this will run immediately, OK? And then if we want to get the actual result, we'll call compute. Um, you'll see some stuff happening here. Some things are happening in parallel, and we brought it down to about two seconds. Um, if we look at the um, task graph for total and, and visualize that, You'll see we have a whole bunch of increments happening in parallel, and then we take our sum. Um, it's also worth kind of looking at the task graph for what if um, what if the result here was if we did just a uh, total equal sum of results rather than the delayed sum, uh, and visualize that. And you can see we kind of get this. Uh, I'm going to plot this sideways right there equal to LR. This kind of tree-like structure where we're doing these. Um, increments and then sums uh, kind of, in, yeah, not in parallel, notably, okay. And that's, uh, you know, built into the way that Python sum works is it iterates over the sequence, taking at one item, adding it to the other. Okay. Um, I think for time, we'll skip over this next example. Uh, just note that uh, not everything, you know, DAS delayed isn't magic. You can't do things like parallelize um, flow control. So if you have a couple of functions like double and is even, um, and you're going to like treat even numbers differently from odd numbers, okay, we're going to double even numbers, we're going to increment odd numbers, um, then uh, you can't like wrap this in delayed because Dask isn't able to build that kind of task graph of, you know, I don't know which one it's going to be. I need to know up front, you know, when I'm building this task graph, what, what function do I need to call? And with this 
uh, delayed uh, is even, we can't kind of decide. So um, just a note there about flow control. Okay, uh, and then uh, very briefly, and this will be the last thing, uh, just like a bit about background about Dask. Um, so it's it's came up in this environment like the 2015 or so, 2016 timeframe, maybe a little later, um, where we had the scientific Python ecosystem had these libraries like NumPy and Pandas that were uh, very powerful. They have these really powerful uh, in-memory containers. So for the most part, they just work on in-memory data sets. You can't work on a data set that's larger than memory uh, with NumPy or Pandas uh, most of the time. Uh, and for the most part, uh, NumPy and Pandas, uh, they're using just a single thread of your potentially multi-core machine. Uh, unless you're doing things like uh, linear algebra, which is using uh, BLOSS or LAPAC. So for the most part, uh, NumPy pandas, single threaded uh, in memory data structures. Um, so that's kind of where, where Dask was uh, born out is this desire to work with these larger than memory data sets um, in a reasonable amount of time. So we need to be able to parallelize it. Uh, but at the same time, Dask didn't want to like throw away NumPy and pandas just because they uh, you know, don't work for larger than memory data sets. Um, Dask actually uses like NumPy and pandas. If you're doing something with a Dask array, like a dot product between two large uh, matrices, that Dask array dot product is gonna have a whole bunch of smaller uh, NumPy arrays in it. So a Dask array is composed of many NumPy arrays. And a Dask dot product is really just coordinating a bunch of dot products and some other operations on those NumPy arrays that are within it. All right, that's the basic uh, kind of uh, way that Dask operates. Um, you build up these task graphs. Okay, we were building up those task graphs with Dask delayed. Uh, you can also use Dask array, Dask data frame, X-ray also implements the collections interface. So you can use um, it to build up these, these task graphs, um, which are just like functions to call on some data. Uh, and then when you ask for a result, either explicitly by doing something like dot compute or by uh, you know, plotting it, something like that, uh, Dask will take that task graph and hand it off to a scheduler. Uh, so this can be a scheduler on a single machine uh, using threads or processes, or it can be the distributed scheduler, which we'll see in the, in the net, next notebook. Okay, and it's also worth noting that you've, you've all already used Dask in the previous notebook uh, when we were doing our NDVI computation. Um, that was actually loading data in parallel and doing the, the you know, divisions and additions and things like that in parallel using Dask. Okay, if you don't ask for anything else, uh, X-Array, uh, we, were, we were loading in these chunked X-Array data arrays which uses Dask under the hood uh, and it was operating in parallel using a thread pool. So there's, uh, you know, sometimes you can use Dask and it's you know, just magic. It's magically gonna operate in the background to do things in parallel. Um, other times you're going to want to be a bit more explicit about how the parallelism occurs. If you want more control over things like memory usage, exactly how the computation evolves. So um, we'll, uh, we'll see in the next notebook, we'll see this kind of more distributed working on a cluster of machines um, set up. Okay, with that, I think it is time for the break um, for about 30 minutes or so. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so I'll be hanging out. Uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, okay. I'll see you in about 30 minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, Tom, the stage is yours. All right, great. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, one thing I forgot to have you do uh, in the previous notebooks is to uh, shut them down when you're done with them. Um, this will clean up some stuff, uh, maybe refree some memory that we can use later on. So um, I would say uh, shut down the, you probably have the reading stack in the uh, Dask notebooks open. So if you go ahead and shut those down, um, we're gonna move on to the third notebook, which is about uh, some cloud native concepts. So again, that's under this, um, this is a stop button maybe. Um, if you open that up and then shut down the um, previous two notebooks and then we'll start up on the cloud native notebook. Okay, make this wider. Okay, cool. Um, so 
Plan Theory Computer uh, kind of you know embraces some cloud native concepts. Um, first of all, you have uh, direct access to all of the data. So Plan Theory Computer, it's got something like fifty petabytes or so of data of of assets that are available to you. Um, that's not like something you can do, you know, on like a local file system. Maybe on like an HPC file system that'd be possible, but. Uh, you know, on the cloud, uh, the only way that's doable is through like uh, scalable APIs like Azure Blob Storage. So that's where all of the data are hosted and you have direct access to it. Um, and Azure Blob Storage has HTTP APIs. So you can use libraries like uh, GDAL or everything built on top of it, like QGIS to access the assets from Blob Storage over HTTP. Um, or you can use like the uh, native Azure Blob Storage APIs uh, to actually open the, the bytes from Azure Blob Storage over the network. Um, wherever possible, we use uh, cloud native formats. Um, so these are, are things like COG, which we've already seen, ZAR, we saw briefly, uh, GeoParquet for tabular data, uh, Copic for point cloud data. Um, all of these files formats have some things in common. Uh, first of all, they can be accessed over the network. So, you know, we already you know, saw we, we can't have a local, like regular disk attached uh, with all 50 petabytes of data. So we have to uh, access the data over the network. Um, these file formats they support efficient access to the metadata. So typically there's some you know, metadata up front that can be quickly accessed without having to read all of the data. Um, they also typically support accessing uh, subsets of the data efficiently. So something like a cog, you can slice out like a single uh, rectangle from that cog without having to read the entire thing. Uh, likewise for ZAR, GeoParquet, you can select you know, lots of things you can do with Parquet uh, and Copic as well. Okay. Uh, so if you're accessing the data over the network, it's important to put that um, that compute next to the data uh, as you know close as possible, with as you know high bandwidth as, uh, of a connection as possible. Um, so all of our our files, our assets, are stored in the West Europe uh, Azure data region. Uh, so our compute that you're working on here today, these Jupyter notebook servers, they're also deployed in Azure West Europe. Um, in the exact same data center. Uh, and then finally, you know, Azure has the ability to uh, quickly scale up and down based on you know, demand or, or whatever you care about. Um, so that's uh, you know, Azure and all the clouds, that's like one of the main selling points is uh, the ability to scale up and down uh, elastically. Just to kind of illustrate the importance of, uh, of co-locating the compute with the data, um, this little uh, informal benchmark, uh, I ran GDAL info on this NAEP uh, scene, uh, Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF, that's in uh, Azure Blob Storage in West Europe. And so I, earlier I ran this, uh, timed it from my home here in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, it took about seven seconds just to get back the you know few kilobytes of, of metadata uh, that GDAL info prints out. Yeah. Most of that time was just spent waiting, uh, waiting to send the the um, you know request HTTP request through the public internet into Azure into the right data center. Uh, Blob Storage did its little thing to to get the data and then return the response. But um, yeah, so that took a, a long time. Uh, it's a long time to wait. Um, if you're uh, you know physically closer to that uh, data center, uh, ideally within the exact same region, things are going to be. Uh, much faster. So run that, you know, less than a couple hundred milliseconds. So huge speed up, uh, exact same command. The only difference is where the uh, compute is happening, where that uh, source of that HTTP request is. So uh, if you're working with data from the planetary computer, it's very, very important. Put your compute in Azure next to the data. You'll get the highest performance. Okay. Uh, we already talked about uh, stack. Um, I'm just briefly going to execute this command. Um, oh no, I forgot to. I was refactoring this right before. Um, right before I forgot to define catalog. Sorry about that. Um, if you go back to the first notebook, uh, you can copy paste it from the very start here. Sorry about that. I'll also put it in the chat uh, so you have easy access to 
to that. Uh, hopefully this works. Oh, and I've got, I've got all sorts of things. Uh, and I probably for, forgot the bounding box. Now I'm a little confused. Oh, okay, I see what happened. Uh, you can delete these cells um, or just skip them, ignore them, and, and this one as well. I think a couple of things didn't get uh, deleted. So ignore this whole section called stack because we talked about that already in the first notebook. We'll go to the data APIs. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, just briefly wanted to talk about the data API. So we saw that, that's what gave us that rendered preview earlier on. Um, if we open up the, um, the docs page for the data APIs, uh, which I will show you here, API slash data slash V1, you'll see like the uh, slash docs, you'll see the typical API reference. Uh, a whole bunch of things that you can do on like stack items or collections, uh, complicated, more complicated things like uh, mosaics um, that we won't see here today. Uh, but this is what powers, if you're doing things like, uh, you know, putting an item, uh, an image on a map, uh, then you can do that quite easily without having to set up your own compute in Azure. Um, so just to show that we can do things like select the first item here from our, our query. Uh, and then access this tile JSON uh, endpoint. So I'll, I'll show the URL here. So this is the tile JSON URL for, for that. And this is implementing the tile JSON uh, specification. If you make an HTTP request there, you get this uh, ZXY uh, URL, tile server URL. Um, and also includes things like the, um, like the item ID, things like that. Anyway, this is sufficient uh, to put an item on a map so that clients like leaflets uh, are able to you know, interpret um, those URLs and kind of respond to your browser, panning and zooming around and load in the, the necessary tiles. So you can zoom out and get the kind of coarser grained uh, overviews of this scene, uh, zoom in uh, and you know, get the uh, higher resolution uh, assets, the full resolution. Um, so again, in this kind of model, you just have a client, uh, you know, running in your your web browser, uh, local, you know, in your web browser. Um, so here, I'm accessing these from Iowa. Uh, inside Azure, there's this tile server that's running, that's powering our data API. It's based on ttiler, the Python library, um, and that's what's getting the data from blob storage. Uh, you know, doing responding to these requests for these uh, windowed reads, things like that, and then sending over the actual images uh, for you. So if you're doing things like uh, just uh, displaying an item uh, or or even a mosaic of items, T Tyler is pretty powerful. Uh, you can potentially get away with uh, just using our our data API and not using um, not setting up your own compute. Okay. Uh, I would encourage you to, and maybe, you know, maybe just take a couple minutes to play around with this, uh, check out our Explorer. Uh, so our data APIs uh, is, and our stack API is what powers our, our Explorer. So the idea is, you know, you select a data set here. Uh, we've done a lot of Landsat already. Uh, let's do like a, a elevation model here. Um, you put in one of these data sets and then it, you know, looks at your browser window, queries, you know, what area is it covering, and then uh, loads up the assets uh, you, and renders them, mosaics them, renders them using the, the data API. Uh, so you're gonna do like Sentinel-1 RTC or something like that. You can see these um, items in, in the, you know, the Sentinel-1 RTC, it's a, you know, SAR data set. Uh, so you can make like complicated, um, color composites of from the various bands. So uh, pan and zoom around and, and stuff gets you know loaded in based on where your browser window is at. So um, that's the same thing. Again, to use this Explorer, you don't have to set up your, your own compute. It's just using the uh, stack API to do the queries uh, and then mosaicing them, rendering them with the data API. So uh, if you want, you can, uh, as I'm talking, uh, I would you know encourage you to uh, check out all these data sets here and see uh, see what all is available. This is a nice way to get a good overview of the kind of data sets available through the planetary API and you know what they what they look like. Okay. 
I will stop playing with that. Um, like I mentioned, Azure has tons and tons of different ways to do compute. Um, we offer like a hub where you, you can you know, log in and very conveniently and easily get started uh, on the plant and computer, working with our data, using our images, uh, using our compute for, it's good for like small and medium sized problems. Um, that hub, it's very, it's like identical to this hub roughly. It's, it's a Jupyter Hub deployment um, that's been uh, enabled with Dask for scalability. Uh, specifically using DAS gateways. So this is a kind of approach that was pioneered by the Pangeo community, group of uh, geo scientists trying to work on large data sets in the cloud. Um, the way DAS gateway works is, you know, uh, end of the day, if you want to do some large computation on a, a large data set, you're going to need uh, a bunch of hardware uh, resources. Um, Desk Gateway kind of uh, abstracts over that. It's a way to, you know, ask for Desk clusters, uh, you know, for many users uh, to ask for Desk clusters uh, without having the users having to know about the kind of underlying hardware uh, components or or how the um, actual resources are are managed. Um, so the way you use it is uh, to import DAS gateway and ask for a gateway cluster. So this will uh, do some stuff in the background, which I can show you. It's, it's using, um, in this case, it's using Azure Kubernetes service, uh, asking for a cluster, we'll start a scheduler pod uh, and then asking it to scale, we'll uh, start up some worker pods. So depending on whether there's you know room on an existing virtual machine or not it's going to have to uh das gateway will ask azure kubernetes service for some um, additional nodes to come up uh, but if we look at our our dask nodes here i'll bring this over um, you can see some uh workers uh worker nodes starting to uh spin up on this uh cluster here on this uh azure sorry <laughs> lots of clusters on this uh kubernetes cluster we have some additional worker pods coming up uh it's probably scaling them up uh maybe this one fit um you know maybe it fits uh some other ones uh if you're a bit slower you're, you're there probably wasn't room available uh so it's going to start um it's going to start uh, spinning up additional worker nodes in the background. So Kubernetes is going to manage that. Um, as a user, you don't have to know about Kubernetes or anything like that. You just need to uh, know about how to you know, ask for a cluster, uh, maybe customize it. As your workers uh, start coming online, you, know, you can click the link here to get the uh, URL um, for the DAS dashboard. I'll paste that here. But you know, you start to do computations, uh, and now we're really using a distributed cluster. So, I had two workers, uh, you know, ready when I kicked this off. Eventually, all eight will show up, hopefully. Uh, and when you do a computation like this, uh, you know, grouping by name and, and taking a few aggregations here, um, that computation is actually happening on those remote workers. Okay, so now you need to be thinking about things like, you know, communication between workers is relatively expensive, um, things like that when you're doing your compute, but the, uh, you know, there's the ability there to scale up to much uh, larger computations. Okay, uh, any questions on cloud native stuff on DAS gateway before we move on to the next notebook? I'll pause there for a second. Okay, great. Um, so I will explicitly ask you all to close your clusters. Make sure to do that. Uh, you might also want to stop this uh, notebook kernel. We don't have too much uh, memory there, but you can do that in the kernel screen uh, to shut down this kernel or again over here in the sidebar. Um, and then if you open up the next uh, file, you're gonna go through this cloudless mosaic or composite example. Um, I'm going to get my cluster up and running uh, real quick. That's part of why we just ran through that last notebook is to get the kind of cluster warmed up. So we'll get some workers uh, nice and quick here, hopefully, assuming everyone uh, closed theirs down in time. Um, okay, and then I'm going to bring up the dashboard. 
So again, we're going on to the cloudless uh, mosaic example next. And hopefully my workers will come up quickly. You all will be getting some workers too. All right, um, we can talk through uh, you know the operations that we'll be doing, but again, uh, our computation is going to be happening on the cluster. If you want to make sure, uh, you can you know, click on the link to see what your cluster is doing. Um, I'm also going to bring up my uh, worker memory tab here, just so I can see when some workers come online. Okay. So in this uh, example, we're going to be uh, working again over Redmond, Washington. If you want, you can you know, change this around, pick a different area. Uh, I didn't show it, but the Explorer has a way to easily uh, explore. You know, it takes your window uh, and get your area of interest that way if you want. So that's using the Explorer results on the hub button. Okay, uh, we're going to use the same area of interest though. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and search. Uh, in this case, we're using Sentinel-2, level 2A. And we're going to pick uh, items that are not uh, too cloudy. Okay, less than 25% cloudy. Um, those items, they will still have some clouds in them. And so we're going to use um, uh, planetary computer, uh, or sorry, stack, stack to stack those together into a time series. And then we'll do a kind of mosaicing operation that takes the median over time in order to, um, you know, basically remove all the clouds because the uh, average, the median pixel um, will not contain a cloud most likely. It will also preserve the features of things like the buildings and you know, roads and things like that, but uh, there shouldn't be a cloud present in the median pixel since they uh, come and go. All right, I apparently was not lucky. Hopefully some of you all are, are getting your workers coming up online here, but you'll see uh, lots and lots of, of pods coming up here. Mostly what we're waiting on is uh, Azure uh, to give us new virtual machines. Um, and then those virtual machines have to um, download the uh, environments, the Docker images that uh, have all of our packages and stuff on them. So. Uh, this will take you know a couple of minutes to load up. Um, I could try running this. So Dask is you know kind of smart. Um, how much? Uh, let's check out the size of this. Um, this thing is it's only four gigs. Uh, once we do the reduced resolution, we have I think our cluster has how much memory? Sixteen, plenty of memory. So I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. It'll take a little time. Hopefully workers come online um, in the middle of this computation and Dask will automatically tell them to start um, working on it. So we'll see how this goes. If you already had 24 workers or whatever we scaled this up to, this will go much, much faster. Oh, and I forgot to mention, so we're, we're using StackStack's uh, resolution keyword here. Uh, so natively, I think these are 10 meter resolution. Um, so we're going to kind of, as we're reading, we're going to upsample them, downsample, uh, anyway, uh, make them uh, coarser grained, uh, just so that the later computations go a bit faster. But right now we're just uh, loading in data. This is a new uh, method you haven't seen before, but um, now that we have a, a distributed cluster, we can do things like kind of control when uh, data is loaded into memory. Um, so we're going to, since the, the the full thing isn't too large. We're going to go ahead and persist the full, uh, you know, upsample, downsample data set into memory here. I do wish I had all my workers. They'll come online soon, I'm sure. Just going to check out the uh, nodes here. Uh, worker. Yeah, so hopefully network unavailable. I've never actually seen that before. That's a bit of a problem. <laughs> Uh, we have a few workers coming on. Oh, maybe that's because they just showed up uh, a few seconds ago. So hopefully those are going to, um, yeah. So we see some workers have been around for a while, and those are all good. Getting some nodes, uh, worker uh, pods scheduled onto them. And then hopefully these networks uh, become available shortly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. 
And then, yeah, Dask, like I said, it's, you know, smart enough. And there's actually like an adaptive mode in Dask where you can, uh, you know, dynamically scale up and down your number of workers based on the uh, load, the number of like outstanding tasks that you've asked it to do. Uh, to work on, uh, and it'll take care of uh, scheduling uh, work on uh, new workers as they show up. So hopefully I'll be getting some more workers here shortly. Maybe you all already have workers and can carry on with the next step if you want. Um, for now, I'll just have to wait. So if there are any questions, this would be a good time to, to ask them. or you can keep playing around with the Explorer while you're waiting. One cool thing you can do is uh, like pin a layer. So I pin that world cover layer and then like overlay, you know, it's based off of Sentinel too. So overlay the, um, you know, uh, Sentinel, the land cover, sorry. Yeah, the classification on top of the uh, Sentinel 2 imagery and kind of see what's going on there. Uh, I need to zoom in for the full imagery though. Kind of see see that. Control the opacity here. Okay. Um, question about displaying the task stream. Um, you need to make sure, so either uh, under the cluster output here, you can click on this dashboard link. Uh, and that'll open it up for you. Um, and if you want it in the Jupyter Lab session, like I have, um, then you can go ahead and uh, copy that URL here. Copy that URL and then open up the Dask uh, Lab extension here, paste it, and then press Enter, I think. I have some workers. Uh, it's like 20, 21, 22 workers. So it'll start churning through this uh, much more quickly now. And we also get to see like the nice adaptive behavior. New workers show up, Dask's able to um, kind of, you know, rebalance things, um, outstanding tasks as they show up. <clears throat> okay. Once um, and we at any time really, uh, we can start working on this next step here. We're we're going to take the um, median composite. Um, currently, the way this is implement, it's implemented in Dask is, um, and if we think about our our data structure uh, here, like how is it chunked? Uh, we can see that we're chunked. Um, I'm going to make this a tad smaller. Uh, we're chunked um, along time and band here. Uh, you can kind of see it in this uh, HTML wrapper here. We're chunked along time and band, and we have kind of contiguous blocks for the X and, and Y. So each uh, scene, each um, band of the scene is, is one chunk. And to do the median over time, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of split up these larger slices here um, and into smaller pieces and then kind of shuffle data around to get all of the data for a single time. Um, or sorry, all of the data across time for a single little window of the data onto the same worker. And then we'll take the median over, over time. So that's the way it's currently implemented. It, it is like a bit communication heavy. Um, you'll see it in, in red here, all the uh, transfer rechunk merge. So red is communication between workers. Dask has done that kind of splitting, um, sending data to the right workers. Uh, each data works on like a little window, the entire time series for a little window, uh, and, and then collapses time using a median. Um, so median, if we if we look at that now, at this point, it's a you know concrete X-ray data array. We have an actual NumPy array. We've collapsed over time, so we have band Y and X. We we'll use X-ray spatial's uh, true color method to uh, make a true color image, and we can go ahead and plot that. So, as you see, we spent most of our time, you know, waiting around for I/O. Uh, once data is in memory, things are pretty quick for this type of operation. Even considering that we needed to move some data around. Okay. Um, you know, the great thing about X-ray is this general-purpose library, so we can do 
you know, fairly complicated um, operations like grouping by the uh, month of the year. So say we, we have some data from like January, February, March, maybe we don't want to combine images from January and July. We'll lose things like snow cover, things like that, that probably uh, should be present in our median. So we can do a, uh, you know, per group median. And so in this case, or sorry, per month or per group median. Um, so we'll have one uh, data array, um, or sorry, we'll, we'll have I can just show it here. We'll now have a uh, additional dimension for the uh, month of the year. And so we can turn all of those into images and, and plot them as like a uh, collection of uh, cloud-free mosaics. And you see some you know snow cover here in January and uh, that's gone, uh, of course, in the summer for the most part coming back in uh, November and December. Okay, any questions about, um, about that, those operations that we did about how we used um, DAS Gateway there to distribute the workload? So once you're you're done with that uh, notebook, you can go ahead and free up those uh, resources. So uh, you know, shut down the kernel um, or just restart it. But I'll shut it down here, and I'll pop over to the uh, next notebook, this Hurricane Florence animation. Um, so here's our our final product. I can I don't know. You can you know, stream it locally on your laptop or desktop, but uh, if you want to see it through Zoom, YouTube, here's the um, animation that we'll be making. So this was a hurricane, Hurricane Florence, as it was over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this animation was made using imagery from the GOES uh, CMI product stack collection. GOES is a geostationary satellite, and we're going to, um, we're going to, load it up here. Before I do that, there was a question uh, going over the splitting again. I'm going to restart my kernel so I can get back to that point um, real quick. And I will jump down there. Um, data, yep, cool. I don't actually need to persist the data, but um, okay, so talking about the splitting again here. So we have data here, right? It's a um, data array. Each of these items in the uh, the time dimension, it's this NumPy, NumPy daytime64 array. And so they have these uh, .dt month kind of attribute, which is gonna be the month of the year, starting with zero, that the um, image was, you know, captured that the stack item belongs to. Okay, so basically, uh, X-ray has a a way like pandas. If you've used pandas or uh, dplyrs, uh, group by or SQL, um, you can group by some attributes. So in this case, we'll group by the time dimensions month attribute. That gives us this kind of data array group by thing, which has various aggregations you can do on it, like uh, dot mean. Max will do the median. So this returns this kind of uh, data array structure that has the 12 uh, kind of time uh, components in the time dimension. So we've grouped together everything in the same month. So all of the image from August have been grouped together in the same group. And for those, we've taken the median. But they're separate from the ones in July and September. So it's very similar to our output above, except we get this additional uh, month dimension. Okay. Let's go through, I'm gonna restart that again so that I free up those workers. Let's go over this. Uh, first thing we need to do is uh, find where the storm's at. Um, so this NOAA team has uh, a nice data set on the um, tropical storms, hurricanes, all sorts of things um, available. So it's not in the planetary computer. 
hopefully someday we can get something like it. But for now, we'll just make an HTTP request to grab this net CDF file. The structure is a bit complicated, uh, but here's the storm ID for Hurricane Florence. So we'll go ahead and open up that file. We'll find where the Hurricane Florence values are in the um, in the file in the NetCDF uh, uh, data set, and then select that out. So I can show you some of the those. So data, it's got a, a bunch of things on it, a uh, ton of information, but the Main ones we'll be using are the uh, kind of date, time, uh, latitude, and longitude for each of these like observations. So you can do cool things like looking at the they have things like the wind speed. I think all sorts of, of different things are available, uh, kind of depending on the data set. So this is a really cool data set um, that's available through that uh, NOAA website. We're going to be ignoring all these additional data fields and just using the um, date, uh, time, and the uh, latitude and longitude. We'll put that uh, geometry into a GeoPandas uh, geo data frame and kind of plot the um, area that we'll be looking at. So this is the full path that the hurricane took back from it was a, a tropical storm or even before that, right? Uh, all the way to landfall and then uh, to it, it uh, weaned off. But for now, we're gonna be animating this period here, which is, it's about uh, three hours or so, two and a half hours of time as it was over the Atlantic Ocean. So now the question is, how do we get the actual images that were you know, uh, at that point in time and that area? in space. And of course, we will use stack. So again, we'll connect to the uh, planetary computer stack API. We're going to be using this goes uh, CMI data set with this bounding box, this date time that we decided to look at. And we're using that uh, goes image type um, you know, custom query uh, filtering property um, to just grab the mesoscale images. As a reminder, GOES has like these various modes that it's capturing in. Uh, we only care about the mesoscale ones. GOES is a kind of interesting one to look at uh, in the Explorer, just since it's um, it's like a, uh, you know, geospatial, geostationary orbit. So some of the Images are, are pretty interesting. It has an interesting um, uh, pattern. I'm going to go to yesterday so that we have some non nighttime images. But uh, if we filter down to just the uh, image type for the full disk, kind of see here's a, a full disk image. So this is what the full disk looks like. And then we're going to be working with uh, some mesoscale images, which are much smaller and zoomed in on specific areas. They'll kind of all get mosaic together here, which isn't the most uh, meaningful thing. Okay, so we'll do that search. Uh, you see stack the database table quickly give us back those items that we asked for. Um, we're gonna be um, building up a, a few things, but just to make sure we're on the right track, I'm gonna have you go ahead and select the first item Okay, uh, earliest item and uh, plot that, open it up with Rio X-Ray and then plot it. And you'll be using the signed items here. Remember, we need to sign the items before we open up the data. So go ahead and use signed items to open those up. We're gonna be plotting the blue band. So again, if you wanna figure out what uh, asset that's under, check out the data set description. All right, let's do two minutes on that. If you're not a uh, Python programmer, this is a way to define like a little function in line. So this will get past stack items like this, which have a a field that indicates the date time. A small hint there. 
All righty. All right, so let's go ahead and go through this. So we're taking the minimum over the assigned items. We want to get the uh, very first one, uh, x dot date time. There's a few other ways you could do this. So the planetary computer always returns its items uh, in most recent first. So this is the most recent item. It's not um, uh, square bracket zero. You can also do minus one, it'll be the oldest item, or it can be explicit and sort it, uh, take the minimum. Um, we are going to open up the, so that's an item, pi stack item. Uh, I'll split this so you can see. Uh, Item.assets, it has a whole bunch of assets. Uh, we want one of the assets, the C0 something, and checking the uh, description here, uh, I'll search for blue. Uh, we want the, uh, we'll do the one kilometer, C01, one cam. Okay, um, so we'll do item.assets, C01, and uh, href to open that up, and then we'll plot it. Um, did I... I do something wrong here. Item dot assets. I think I looked up. We have a couple of tables here. Oh no, that should be right. Oh, maybe uh, yes, two kilometers. I'd have to double check. When is that available? That might only be available in certain modes. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure when it has one kilometer versus two kilometer resolution. Anyway. Um, here's our, our mesoscale image. And you can see the storm here. Um, and this is actually the water in white. Okay, any questions on that? All righty. So we're gonna use um, ODC stack in this case. Um, it's very similar to um, stack stack. Uh, there's a slight issue. It's actually been fixed. So Kirill, the maintainer of open data cube fix this in like a couple of days. So uh, I don't have the fixed version in this environment yet. So we're gonna uh, drop a few kind of uh, assets that we're not gonna load up anyway. So we're just gonna mutate these items and only keep these three uh, bands that we're gonna use. We can use ODC stack to load those up. And we'll do a bit of uh, renaming here of the bands. So by default, it would use like the, the names uh, from the stack keys, I think. We're gonna use the common names, which is available under the EO bands extension. So we have a red, blue, and a near infrared uh, band here. The primary difference uh, between ODC stack and stack stack um, is how they, the data structure that they return so stack stack returns a data array. Uh, ODC stack returns a data set with one um, band, with one, uh, yeah, uh, one data array per band, basically. So in this case, we have three data arrays within this data set. Otherwise, uh, they're very similar. Okay. Um, to select a single data array out of the data set, you can use a dictionary style uh, get item with square brackets. Great. Next exercise uh, is to create a green band, all right, uh, using this formula here. So some more band math. Uh, hopefully it's not too boring, but um, yeah, make this new green band. That's a combination of the other bands. Give you a minute to work on that. This would be very similar to the NDVI example. If you want to look back there and then the solutions in the next cell. All righty. Let's go ahead and go through this one. Uh, so it should be 0 0.48 times the red band plus 0 0.1 times the near infrared band plus 0 0.45 times the blue band. This will be our green band, which will look very similar to the other, same time uh, y and x, uh, only the values, values here will be kind of the synthetic green band. So if you have any questions, raise them in the chat. Double check we got it right. Actually, I think my, is that right? Oh no, uh, I got the uh, 0 0.45. 
Hopefully that is right. Yeah. Oh, and this one's. Uh, who knows which the right one is? Maybe it's in this paper here. I think I might have mixed up my coefficients as I was writing this up. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it quickly. Green equals four five uh, times red. Oh, so it is all zero dot four five. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know where I got the zero dot four eight, um, but this would all be four five. My apologies. So if you want to fix that there, uh, zero dot four five for everything. I don't think it's going to affect our our uh, picture all that much. Okay. Cool. Um, do some other stuff, uh, basically to make the picture look nice. Uh, so we're gonna add this green band to our data array as a, another, sorry, our data set as another data array. Um, basically merge all those separate slices into a single 4, 4D array with time band Y and X, get them in the right order, uh, and then select out just the red, green, and blue. We don't need the near infrared anymore. Do a couple of things just to make it uh, look nicer. This kind of gamma correction makes it pop a bit more. Clip it to between zero and one, and then we're ready to go. So at this point, you could, you know, uh, I'll, I'll run this on a single machine. It, it doesn't take too long, uh, about 90 seconds. Um, so I'll run this here. You could also um, run it on, you know, start up a, a gateway cluster and run it on a cluster if you if you want. There should still be some workers around. But I'll just do it on a single machine. Open up my dashboard here. It's doing things like loading uh, the various bands and then doing the, uh, it's, they're too small, uh, but doing the addition, subtraction, and then uh, transposing, sticking together. All these things kind of got built up. Again, we're using Dask. We, had, we hadn't even created our, our cluster uh, until now, but we're building up this task graph and then go ahead and compute on it. And uh, we'll be getting our result here shortly. Okay. Once that finishes up, uh, all that's left to do is uh, really just uh, make the animation. First of all, we'll check the first band just to make sure that things look okay. Uh, make sure we got our red green and our, our synthetic green band um, built correctly and then uh, plot that one. You can see it looks looks pretty good, passes some visual inspection. Uh, so then we can go ahead and do the animation here. Uh, not really gonna talk through this. It's you know, not really the point, but Matt Potlob has a funk animation um, little helper thing where you give it like a plotting function. In this case, we're uh, selecting some data and then uh, setting it to this image thing. So this is basically what X-ray does for us. Okay. Oh, we're also doing a bit of stuff like throwing the um, label of the uh, the value of the date time so that we have you know some sort of indication of what time is uh, currently being displayed. Um, all the data was already loaded up in memory, so that didn't take too long. And then you have your uh, very own uh, homegrown uh, goes our animation that you can play uh, locally. So it's pretty, pretty cool to look at. Um, I'm sure there's some scientifically, you know, valuable information you can get out of here. I don't know how to do that. Maybe you all do. Maybe bring in some of the other uh, fields that were available in that original uh, NetCDF file, things like the wind speed and probably has like temperature in there too, maybe. So that's a fun uh, extension you could do if you're so interested. All righty. You are going to want to, um, when you finish the, up this notebook, we'll go through one more, I think, and then uh, call it a day. Um, you're going to want to shut down this notebook. You can see we're at about five uh, gigs of memory here. So um, you can hit zero a bunch of times to restart it. You can go to the kernel uh, and shut down that notebook if you want. That'll free up the memory for the last example here. Um, which one should we go through? I think we'll do proximity. 
uh, you can, of course, uh, you know, check these out on your own. Um, I'll give you some links at the end, but we'll briefly talk through this proximity um, tools example, getting to some actual like um, geospatial operations you might want to do on these kind of raster data sets. All righty. We'll again be using a local cluster. You can also uh, start up a gateway cluster if you want. Uh, DAS doesn't care either way. Okay, yep, so I got my cluster here. Again, we always start with stack, of course. So uh, using stack to search for this area over the Amazon rainforest. We're we'll be using another data set. Uh, the uh, I forget what the JRC. This is like a global surface water. I think it's from the ECMWF or the European Commission, anyway. Uh, a data set on uh, water bodies of water, basically. So things like flooding events, um, seasonality of water. So it's a, a really interesting data set um, that's uh, available here. Okay. We'll grab off uh, one of these items. It actually just has a, a single item, uh, I think per uh, year. I'm pretty sure it's per year. I could be wrong about that. Um, and we'll load up uh, a few um, assets. So there's extent, seasonality, and transitions. All this is kind of lightly explained here. Uh, but the user guide has a, a bunch of really good documentation on, on how to use this data set if you're interested in using it. Okay, we loaded up this uh, data array. Our three assets are X and R, Y, and again, uh, no time since we just selected a single item here. Uh, this is kind of ugly. We're going to get some color maps out of the cogs themselves. So we're going to skip over all of that stuff. It's just a way to load up the uh, color map information that's embedded within the cogs so that we can make a plot using kind of their recommended color maps. Um, extent shows, I think it's like the largest uh, or the you know uh, broadest uh, uh, extent. So whether the uh, that pixel was ever covered with water over the course of the year. Uh, seasonality, uh, I think it shows the number of months from like zero to 11 probably, uh, number of months that there, the area, the pixel was covered. Uh, transitions, it's some complicated thing of like, this is permanently water, or this is you know permanent water that became uh, uh, not permanent. So I don't know, eh, it's pretty complicated, but there's a bunch of different transitions uh, of you know initial states and end states that um, transitions captures. All right. We're going to be doing some uh, proximity analysis. So basically, you know, looking at each pixel in this data array or one of these data arrays, and asking, you know, what is the closest kind of target pixel for some definition of closest, some def definition of of target. Um, re remember that extent is showing like this pixel is non-zero if it's ever covered uh, in water over the course of the year. Otherwise, it's zero. Uh, the default kind of be a, you can, you can pass in. So if you're using this uh, proximity, you can pass in a, a data array of, of the raster that you're interested in analyzing and then some target values. So um, I think, uh, yeah, values that you're interested in, like considering true or whatever, however you want to think about it. Um, so we're going to be looking for um, the nearest pixel that was ever covered with water for everything in this extent. Um, data array. And that'll return um, the uh, distance in Euclidean uh, coordinates by default. One other thing that is uh, um, potentially useful is to set like an upper bound on the search. So by default, it's going to search until it hits the either edge of the raster or the nearest point, regardless of how far away that is. Or you can specify like a maximum distance that it's allowed to search for each pixel. Um, so we'll do that as well, passing in that max distance here of however many coordinates uh, or yeah, whatever. That was in long longitude, latitude coordinates. So I don't know exactly how many meters that is. 
um, but you kind of get the two uh, outputs here. So on, on the left, we have this kind of unrestricted search, go as far as you need to, to get to the closest, um, you know, uh, pixel that was ever covered by water. Or on the right, we have our kind of maximum distance of however many meters this translates to. And then everything else is set to, um, I think, either zero or no data. I can't remember. Uh, NAN. I can't remember what the uh, default behavior is there. OK. So that's a, a tool to do kind of like pixel level analysis on these rasters. Um, so uh, that was measuring the distance to the closest um, kind of true point, in this case, uh, ever covered point, um, non-zero. Uh, if you want to do something like the allocation, which um, is the, it's not the direction, it's the actual value of the um, target pixel at that point. Sorry, it's not the distance, it's the uh, value. Okay. So we'll go ahead and do the, um, we're not gonna use the extent. So the extent, remember it's zero or one. It's either zero if it was never covered or one if it was ever covered in the course of the year. Uh, that wouldn't be too interesting. I think it, yeah, that wouldn't be too interesting. Uh, so we're gonna use the transitions uh, data. So for every pixel, find the closest transition. So again, was it permanently water? Uh, did it go from being you know uncovered to flooded or something like that? And we can visualize that. So it just makes like a uh, an interesting looking plot. I have no idea how to interpret this. The uh, the PDF linked from the stack collection actually uh, has like the labels and how to interpret this kind of plot. So this is something that like might have been permanently water and got uh, you know uh, dried out or something or maybe the other way around. So interesting looking diagram, I think. Okay. Um, so we'll, um, I think we'll kind of roughly wrap it up there. I'm going to share a couple of links here. Um, first of all, just again, the homepage, uh, planetarycomputer.microsoft.com. Um, this has, you know, links to everything. So if you want to go there, uh, that's the, the place to start. Um, again, uh, a couple of other, uh, there's the stack spec. Uh, oh, actually, I'll... I'll share specifically the request an account. So again, you don't need an account to use the data, um, but if you want like higher rate limits, uh, that's the place to request an account. We're generally approving those daily. Uh, so that's account slash request. And then a couple of other links throughout uh, the stack community around uh, stack spec is worth looking at. Uh, it's a nice community. And then I would say the uh, Pangeo discourse is if you're trying to do like scalable geoscience, uh, either on the cloud or on HPC, uh, Pangeo folks are uh, pushing the forefront there. So a few links, I'll drop all these in the chat as well. Um, maybe I'll yeah, I can just leave those. And then if you're interested, follow up with them there. That did not get formatted the best, but uh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you all for uh, listening, for attending. I'll be tearing down this cluster sometime later today. Um, but uh, if you want, you can go ahead and request an account and log on a, on a very similar one on the Planetary Computer Hub. Awesome. Thank you all. Thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, thanks a lot also for providing uh, an interesting uh, interactive lecture uh, with mm -hmm. all the size and the links. Uh, maybe ask any questions here from the from the room. Yes, please. Maybe. Uh, yes. I think I can hear okay. Yeah, from okay. There. <laughs> uh, so sometimes you want to combine uh, sources of data. So is this uh, possible? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if, in case you can catch it, sometimes you want to combine sources of data. Um, yeah. So definitely possible. Uh, the way you do it is probably, and actually uh, I'll share my screen again briefly here. Um, the way you do it is probably uh, stack does let you do multiple uh, collections. All we did was, you know, search over a single collection. Um, stack does let you search over multiple collections. Um, Microsoft Planetary Computer Examples, it does have a way to, um, 
uh, <laughs> you'd probably do multiple searches, uh, one for one data set, one for the other one. I'm just going to look for a co-registration tutorial here. Um, this goes through, uh, I think, uh, something like that. It does a uh, example where you query for Landsat's uh, collection to level two, uh, and then Sentinel. Um, I think I skipped Sentinel. Uh, yeah, so it searches for Sentinel here. So we have a couple of data cubes that we then um, combine together. Um, uh, you can see the failing sensor on Landsat 7 there. Uh, it's a little sad, but um, yeah, so I think uh, these are the two kind of rasters side by side. And then we do a thing, it's a silly example, but it computes uh, NDVI using red from Sentinel and near infrared from Landsat. So uh, the main thing is like, how do you search for these items? Probably using separate searches, you get back your, your data arrays and then you somehow combine them, uh, making sure they're in the same, uh, you know, CRS uh, transformed correctly like that so that you're uh, accurately comparing pixels to uh, from from the same area on Earth. Does that answer your question, hopefully? Uh, yes, can I ask uh, a new one, please? Uh, so after you create a data set like that, uh, can you download it easily? Uh, download, uh, sorry, I missed the very last word. Download what? Uh, if you can download it easily. Easily. Yeah. Yes, download it. Uh, right. So at this point, uh, you have like this in-memory data array uh, that you need to write out somehow, either to ZAR or to NetCDF or to COGS, uh, collection, a singular collection of COGS. So yeah, so X-Ray uh, has bunches of, a bunch of ways to do that. Um, and the only you know trick is like going to be uh, literally downloading it, like the bandwidth. Um, so typically we would recommend that you save it off to your own blob storage account um, so that you can again, access it um, from, from Azure. And like that, that avoids uh, large amounts of data leaving Azure, which is relatively slow. Uh, but if you have a small thing, like a, you know, a reduced um, uh, size thing, small enough that it's not a problem to download it, then yeah, you can, uh, Go ahead and and save it out to disk. Um, it's just like a trick of thinking through like what is local. So like in our examples, if we save uh, save some data set to disk here, this disk is like in the cloud still. So if I want to actually download it, I would save it here and then I would like right click download it. So it's it's you still need to think about like where's your compute happening, what is local, and how do I actually get it down to my laptop or whatever. Okay. Any other question? Okay. So if not, maybe I have a final question for you, Tom. Uh, so is mm -hmm. in your experience, the planetary computer, um, were some applications where planetary computer was the key enabler? Uh, yeah. Um, I think one, one interesting one is the, um, the like impact observatory did that large, um, uh, land use land cover map um, based off of you know, Sentinel-2 imagery and uh, data uh, uh, labels that they they had. Uh, uh, so they were able to use, they weren't using the planetary computer hub, but a very similar setup of Jupyter hub, things like that to kind of iterate, develop the model. Um, the, the, I think they use TensorFlow model uh, for that type of thing. And then using the, all of the data uh, from the, the Sentinel-2 imagery from uh, Planetary Computer, uh, our Azure blob storage, and they were, they were using uh, Azure Batch, which is yet another way to do compute on, um, on Azure to actually uh, run the uh, predictions, the inference uh, for that model to then save out the new layer. So uh, that's like a you know, global planetary scale job uh, that really benefited from the scale of, of Azure, um, both on the storage and the compute side of things. Um, yeah, there's, uh, we, we do have like a little applications page. We're hoping to grow that in the future. So, uh, lots of like smaller, you know, research type examples that have been, been using, uh, planetary computer for that, um, for their, for their own research. And then, yeah, we're, we're, we're always interested in hearing how people are, are using it. Yeah. So do you have a, a fact, the page with applications so people can check that one out? Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot. Uh, more questions? 
If not, uh, thank you again, Tom. Uh, great. Thanks for delivering this online lecture. Maybe next time you can be with us. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.